So back in the earlier days of Dragon Ball Super, and maybe you guys can help me out a little bit down in the comments, but there was an episode, and I'm not sure the exact number, where Vegeta pleaded with Whis to train him. Now this would all come after finding out that Whis is actually the martial arts instructor and overseer of Lord Beerus. But back at this time, I think it's pretty safe to say that Goku and Vegeta were more or less opposed to becoming gods of destruction. But the more they develop these godly powers they possess now in Ultra Instinct and Ultra Ego, I'd say anything is possible. What if Goku, or better yet, I don't know, Vegeta, I guess, were put into a position where they had to accept a job like this? Is the balance of Universe 7 dependent on it? One thing we know for certain is that every universe, and I'm talking about all uh, 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 12, has to maintain this certain mortal ranking or level. And if this number is to fall below a certain threshold, then the God and Supreme Kai of that universe are to face severe consequences. Now, let's just say that maybe this were to happen in universe seven, after the granola arc in particular at some point and before we go any further i just want to remind you guys that this is my very own what if scenario and not canon to super at all but let's assume that because of the devastation caused by moro and miris stepping out of line instead of miris returning as a mortal Zeno would go on to find out about these atrocities and decided to punish universe 7 himself Maris would be permanently deactivated, and because of the disorder and low mortal level currently in Universe 7, Beerus would be summoned to the Grand Priest's Palace soon after. Along with the Supreme Kai because of this negligence, they would both be sealed away at the hands of the Grand Priest. He would also go on to declare that all of those in the mortal realm who have yet to leave a like on the video may suffer the same fate. I personally wouldn't risk it, but... A new age is about to be born at this moment in Dragon Ball as the seed of God of Destruction of Universe 7 is now vacant. But the perfect candidate has already kind of been chosen. With Whis deactivated for the time being as well, the Grand Priest would send word to Earth, summoning Goku and Vegeta to the God Realm immediately with an offer. As Whis had mentioned prior, the two Saiyans having already had their hand in God Key and Divine Training. Learning the news of what happened to Lord Beerus, Goku would nonchalantly decline, feeling kind of bummed out that someone as strong as Beerus is really just gone now. But commitments like that aren't his thing anyway. Vegeta, on the other hand, would be in shock at how the great Lord Beerus could be reprimanded so harshly, but is this really a position that he's ready to uphold himself? Vegeta would go on to consider everything. His life on Earth, his family, but knowing the danger they would be in with the universe unbalanced would outweigh all of these mortal feelings. As Vegeta prepares to depart from the mortal realm for the time being, he would go on to say his goodbyes to Bulma and Trunks, who he would entrust the safety of Bulma and his baby sister Bulla to full time now. When Vegeta says his farewells to Goku, they go on to have a brief discussion as Goku tells Vegeta to not worry about anything he may feel like he's leaving behind down here because Goku and the others will take care of everything. He may have a higher position in the universe, but Goku would never allow Vegeta to surpass him so easily, as he declares that the next time that they fight, he aims to be able to say that he defeated a god of destruction. And this is where we find ourselves today. This is when Vegeta accepts the offer to become the next god of destruction, and if you guys don't want to miss more videos like these, be sure to hit that subscribe button and don't forget to turn on those notifications to never miss an upload as soon as they go live. Vegeta would arrive in the God Realm before the Grand Priest in his palace, and the Grand Priest would further explain to Vegeta the magnitude of the events that took place during their battle with Moro, and how Miris' interaction shook the very order of reality. Because of their authority over Universe 7, Beerus and the Supreme Kai would ultimately be held responsible for these things, but instead of erasing the entire universe itself, these sins would lie solely on them who allowed these things to get out of hand. Vegeta, Saiyan of Earth, you will now be bestowed upon the responsibility of an immortal, he goes on after explaining, with the assignment of an existing Supreme Kai whom your very existence will be intertwined with. Are you prepared to assume this title? Wait, wait a minute, Vegeta replies shocked, remembering this small detail suddenly. So you're telling me that that means if that Kai dies, then I die too, right? That's how it worked with Lord Beerus. 
correct, the Grand Priest replies. The God of Destruction cannot exist without the God of Creation, and vice versa. I have already taken it upon myself to recruit this being as well, as we await your decision. From around the pillars, the Grand Priest's guards stand with a young male Kai who looks nervous as Vegeta kneels before the Grand Priest. Vegeta takes note of him, thinking to himself how weak and fragile this Kai looks, but he turns his attention back to the Grand Priest. Okay, I'm ready, he tells him. This is when the Grand Priest gets up from his throne and walks towards Vegeta, congratulating him on his new position in the multiverse. As from the shadows, we see the silhouettes of the other gods of destruction who are spectating the ceremony as well, Champa trying his best to maintain a neutral face. The transfer of power ritual begins as both the Grand Priest and Vegeta are put through a strenuous physical and mental test. When the ritual would complete, Vegeta would assume immortality and is dressed in the apparel of the Destroyer now. Whis then appears at his side, materializing again having been reactivated with the presence of a new Destroyer now. He greets Vegeta with no questions as Vegeta looks at him shocked, but then it dawns on him that maybe this is just how the God Realm operates. The Grand Priest returns to his throne, exhausted from the ritual which required a lot more out of him since Beerus is sealed, but now the deed is done. And Vegeta now reigns over his home of Universe 7 properly as the God of Destruction. He goes on to address the Grand Priest, Whis, and the rest of the spectators, thanking them for such an opportunity. He bows before them again before exiting the palace with Whis who silently follows him. Lord Vegeta, he says once they exit, shall we return to your planet and resume training? To Vegeta's surprise, however, they don't return to planet Earth, or even the mortal realm. Instead, Whis transports he and Vegeta to a planet that resembled Beerus' old place, with similar structures and a luxurious cabin for him to reside in from now on. This will be your new residence, Lord Vegeta, Whis states. I hope everything is to your liking. When Vegeta appears inside, though, he notices a problem right away, which would make Beerus and Whis' actions actually make a lot more sense now but the food in this place is absolutely terrible. I suppose I see why your trips to Earth were so frequent, Vegeta states as he comes back outside. Whis chuckles as he guides him to the training grounds to begin his first lesson as God of Destruction. I've witnessed your progress in harnessing the power of destruction over the last few training sessions you had with Beerus, Whis tells Vegeta. With your newfound immortality, I'd like you to undergo your strongest transformation, and please, note the difference. When we turn back to Vegeta, his shock is apparent on his face after hearing Whis refer to Beerus without the title Lord, but he shakes it off saying right and begins to power up. Vegeta's aura begins to become menacing and aggressive, turning into a darkish, violent purple as he begins to harness his full godly powers now. When Vegeta transforms into Ultra Ego right away, he feels as if nothing within him changed at all. He's undergone his full form, but it all feels so natural now. I I feel like I could stay like this forever, Vegeta admits, shocked at his own power. Is this the true power of the gods? Back on Earth, Goku has begun training Oob as he too continues to master Ultra Instinct while helping Oob, who has been stated to possess a form of God Key as well. Goku would eventually go back to attempting to train with Whis alongside Vegeta whose new infinite power would prove a major challenge to a mortal such as him, but Goku loves this kind of stuff. Goku and Vegeta would go on to continue to train together almost day in and day out, lest Goku return Oob to Earth to be with his family or to see his own family. Now I know somebody out there is gonna be on their whole well, you know, why did you make Goku an angel? What? Guys, don't trip. We can go back and make an entire. We, we can honestly make a whole what if series about Goku being Vegeta's angel, but I first I gotta see how y'all act about that like button, you know what I'm saying? Whis would eventually come to the point of assisting Oob with his god key training also, while Goku and Vegeta spar day in and day out. You seem tired, Kakarot, Vegeta would say periodically and sarcastically. That form of yours isn't all it's cracked up to be, huh? Goku would reply, taunting Vegeta, that the only reason he's not tired is because he's in the mortal now, as the two go back to clashing in the sky.
Vegeta loiters around in his new home, quiet and kind of bored. Goku is having a blast training Oob. The both of them have undergone exponential growth, especially Oob, who couldn't let up his raw instincts. Not even for a millisecond, it was the least he could do against Master Ultra Instinct Goku. Hey, how you holding up? Goku asks him. I'm fine. I can go on like this for another two weeks, Oob says, breathing heavily, but with a serious glint in his eyes. He meant every single word. Seeing this, Goku sighs and decides to stop the training for a moment. Listen, Oob, he starts. You have just as much potential as any of us Saiyans, though maybe it'd be a good idea to have you go up against your own roots. Your physical disposition has come from Majin Buu after all. Wait, does that mean I'm missing something, Oob asks? Yeah, it's important for you to find a different path. Your mind has subconsciously been too focused on me and the way my abilities work. But I'm a Saiyan and you're not. Ah, uh, I see. Well, what do you suggest then, Oob says, while pretending to have understood what Goku just talked about. Just come with me, Goku says. Let's go meet up with Majin Buu. I'll have you spar with him. Looks like he's playing around at Dende's lookout, he says, as they both instant transmission away. When they get there, Mr. Satan is trying to persuade Piccolo to help him out. Good Buu has been getting quite impatient lately. His body still hasn't forgotten the sensations he felt while fighting against Moro, and now he wants to somehow get his blood boiling once again. The only thing keeping him in check is vast, almost stupid amounts of candy and cake. I don't have any problem getting him those, but by this point, the reporters have started pestering me about what I did after buying the greatest candy manufacturer in the world. I don't want to tell them that it's all to make sure Boo doesn't cause any catastrophic damage. Whatever, it's got nothing to do with me. Let me meditate, Piccolo says, not because he isn't worried about what would happen if Boo were to snap, but because try as hard as he might, he can't possibly sense any sort of malice coming from Boo. He's still as pure as a newborn baby, though their conversation is interrupted when Goku and Oob suddenly land at the lookout. Good Boo's attention is swayed from the ludicrous number of candies in front of him as he glances at Goku and instantly remembers all of the situations where he showed him insane amounts of power. His blood starts riling up and he instantly throws a blow at Goku at that very moment. Of course Goku was able to block it no problem, but things were serious now. Boo wanted a good opponent and Goku was the best one he could possibly ask for. Though as much as he would have liked to fight Boo, Goku didn't forget the main reason they came here. Now wait Boo, this little guy right here is going to be your opponent, not me, he says. Boo starts pouting because he doesn't want to fight some kid, he'd rather fight Goku instead. Meanwhile, Mr. Satan is overjoyed because looks like Goku has finally responded to his endless request of having a quick spar with Boo. Piccolo is unfazed but curious now. So, Boo is about to land another punch on Goku, hoping that he at least strike back this time, but seeing this, Oob gets annoyed. Before Boo could land that punch, however, he dashes towards the point of impact and kicks that punch back, hence in turn, throwing Boo several kilometers away. Piccolo is impressed as he commends young Oob's strength, though of course, it hardly took a minute before Good Boo returned back. Now, before he could say anything, Goku introduces Boo to a rather interesting idea. Listen Boo, between me who you already know about and Oob here whose fighting style you know nothing about, which would be a more interesting fight? Sadly, Boo couldn't see through Goku's gaslighting and immediately became interested in fighting Oob. And so, a sparring session between Boo and Oob begins. I say sparring session, but the two of them were really going at it, hardcore. Goku was delighted as Piccolo asks him if there was any specific reason he wanted those two to fight, to which Piccolo replies, nah, I just wanted to see him fight. Though there is something about Oob's power that's been bugging me. He has God Key, but it feels raw and incomplete, almost as if he needs another missing piece to complete it. I wanted him to fight Boo, hoping that he might discover something about himself during their clashes. You say that, but you really just wanted to see them fight, didn't you, Piccolo smiles, while Goku smirks as well. Meanwhile, as the fight heats up, an interesting aura begins to seep. It must have been lying dormant, but their clashes created a chemical reaction that resulted in awakening something in both of them. It wasn't anything major, but for the first time in forever, Piccolo sensed some malice coming out of Good Boo. Hey Goku, yeah I know, he responds. Let's just observe them for a while. But there was no time left. Though faint, at its inception, this sudden energy created between the two suddenly imploded, leaving both Boo and Oob unconscious. 
Meanwhile, thanks to this rift, the populace in a 1,000 mile radius below suddenly started committing all sorts of inhumane crimes. Dende and Piccolo would be greatly concerned about this. That's when Oob wakes up. His eyes are unrecognizable and the menacing god key raging out of his body is impossible to ignore. Not just for Goku, but also the Supreme Kais who suddenly start freaking out because it's the same presence they felt when Majin Buu first emerged all those millions of years ago. Though Vegeta and Whis are too far away right now, they could also sense this energy coming from Earth, but of course since Goku is there, they have no need to worry so it seems. However, reality was far more sinister. It isn't just that Majin Buu was coming back. If it was that simple, Goku could have taken care of the problem right away. Rather, it was the portrayal of Oob's body literally tearing itself apart while trying to contain and subdue this key. It was only a matter of time before Oob's body completely tore itself apart and Majin Buu emerged from inside. The effects of this key had already enveloped the world below and a few neighboring planets as well, all within a little more than a minute of his outlash. Goku had to act instantly, and he did. He didn't want to take out Oob, so he decided to absorb that key himself. Just like how he absorbed the key of the other Saiyans during his first Super Saiyan God transformation, Goku absorbed Oob's key, all of it, and completely rids him of his connection with Buu whatsoever. However, this sudden collage of a new and corrupted key created a cancerous overload within it. At that, with the intrinsic beast-like nature of a Saiyan, and a new presence would be born inside Universe 7. The Supreme Kais, Vegeta, and Whis aside, even the Grand Priest and Zeno couldn't help but feel uncomfortable now that such a menacing key was in existence. And this would be the catastrophic birth of Oob's God Key, merging with the pureness of Goku's heart, and creating a being so powerful he could only be known as Omni Goku. Piccolo, after watching the events of the last chapter, is extremely perplexed and confused about what's going on with Goku. But before he could say anything else, Omni Goku lifts an arm above his head and sends a humongous Hakai blast towards the sun. It starts off slowly, just barely grazing the clouds, but gradually starts accelerating until finally, within a single minute of its launch, the sun itself is made to explode. Now this was serious, not because the earth had just lost its source of energy, but because the after effects from that explosion were instantly going to vaporize the side of the earth facing the sun. The entire world had come to a pause. There wasn't even any time for media coverage. Dende quickly shouts at Piccolo, hurry, we must further ourselves from that explosion. Now, before Piccolo could fully grasp what's going on, his instincts themselves responded to the threat and his brain responded to Dende's words. He unleashes all the life energy he had accumulated through his meditations and effectively changes the momentum of the planet somehow. But something so momentarily could hardly change their eventual doom. Omni Goku was still there, yawning and feeling kinda hot I guess, kind of ironic because it was the heat that triggered him into destroying the sun in the first place. Meanwhile, Whis would go on to relay the news of the destruction of the sun to Vegeta, who was, at that time, meditating to gain a better understanding of his new powers. Though that's when Whis sensed something quite unexplainable happen. The aftermath of the sun's explosion, the environmental disasters it was about to create, and the sudden implosion of energy, all of it simply disappeared without a trace left whatsoever out of nowhere. But this would all be Omni Goku's doing as well and from the looks of it, even he himself is not too sure how he pulled this off. It just kinda happened on a whim. Well whatever, he couldn't really care less about it and just took off into space after stripping the earth away of its light and source of energy, the sun. Petrified now, Dende finally starts breathing again and Piccolo also breathes a sigh of relief because it looks like they avoided the sudden evaporation of almost half of the earth from that, but whatever was going on with Goku was just as serious and therefore it couldn't be ignored. But was this really a matter that Piccolo could handle? I mean he saw what he just did back there. And cutting back to Whis, he also felt quite confused after realizing how everything just got erased without leaving so much as a trace behind. So instead of being hasty, he actually just takes his time to look at the situation more clearly now. 
It barely takes him a moment before he tries to reverse time by three minutes and fix the situation. He didn't even have time to explain the situation to Vegeta, but shockingly enough, Whis's time manipulation powers simply have no effect. Now this would confirm the bad feeling he had prior as he says that it seems Goku does indeed know that power all too well. The remnants of the sun didn't just disappear though, they were completely erased out of existence. It's as if the sun was never there to begin with. And there is only one individual who is even capable of doing something like that, Whis exclaims. Whis would acknowledge that this is a situation already far beyond their own control, as in his entire lifetime, there were cases when individuals showed similar levels of strength, but none had ever been able to use that same kind of power before. And to top it all off, this one even managed to somehow negate Whis's powers. This had now gone far beyond a situation that Whis and Vegeta could deal with themselves. Consequently, a certain small group of people in Universe 12 who had maintained a low profile for millions of years suddenly get their attention swayed. And this is when we would go on to be introduced to a small but extremely powerful group of warriors from Universe 12 as one of them goes on to say, hey Zenith, here's our cue. Yeah, let's go, looks like we finally found that missing piece to whatever they're talking about here. Get ready, we're headed out to Universe 7 at once, Zenith says. Wait, if someone from Universe 12, a supreme universe, goes to a universe with a lower mortal level, wouldn't the current God of Destruction notice? Besides, I really don't want to get the Grand Priest's attention, Amarok says. Come on, Amarok, you noticed it too, didn't you? If anything, we have to get there before the Grand Priest. We've waited for millions of years. I don't think we'll get another chance like this ever again. Do you still choose to remain in hiding? What do you say, Amarok? Zenith repeats. Amarok, a broken warrior who had lived in the shadows for millions of years, lifts his head up and firmly nods. All of them, this small group, had prepared themselves for the worst. Plus, they were right. The Grand Priest was hot on the case and had indeed taken notice of this situation already. But as the rules go, Universe 7 should resolve this problem themselves or suffer the consequences of the God Realm having to get involved. Now going back to Omni Goku, he didn't just stop at the sun. All of the nearest stars were getting erased one by one and by the time Whis completely explained the situation to Vegeta, Goku had already stripped the galaxy of thousands of stars. Not much considering the scale of the universe, but it was still quite impressive and interesting. Omni Goku, for whatever reason, was only going after the stars that had alien planets nearby. Almost as if he was doing those aliens a favor by erasing that annoying heat from existence. Just what's going on in Goku's head? Vegeta on the other hand is exasperated and he knows that as the god of destruction of their universe, seriously what's the matter with you Kakarot he thinks to himself intensely. Whis knows that confronting Goku without fully grasping what's going on though might not be the best idea, but Whis also momentarily lets curiosity get the better of him. They both instantly lead to put Goku in place who was currently engaging in combat against a powerful soldier from planet Albedo. Light was more important than water to these guys as they had already heard about what happened to neighboring stars and were ready to confront Goku with the strongest soldier they had to offer. Quite unexpectedly, the soldier lands several heavy blows on Goku, but for some reason, Goku wasn't really interested in countering or landing the blows himself. Plus, it wasn't like the destruction had done any damage. After a few minutes into the fight, he finally realizes that he was here to destroy that big star. This one is exponentially bigger than the sun and all of the neighboring planets use this energy as literal life force. Omni Goku unloads a peculiar kind of blast this time. Unlike how he destroyed the first sun and then erased his traces, he's learned to improvise this time. This time, it's a key blast imbued with a tiny drop of power that can erase reality. It was just about to hit the star when Beast and Vegeta appeared. Vegeta instantly uses his own Hakai on the blast, but as expected, it completely erases Vegeta's own Hakai and manages to push directly through it, but even the soldier noticed how the blast had already slowed down massively. 
Vegeta then goes on to use a final flash to completely vaporize what was left of that blast and barely manages to save that star. Omni Goku is of course annoyed and unlike before, now he's kinda serious. Whis asks Goku, what happened to you Goku-san? Goku didn't even respond though as he simply charged ahead to face Vegeta. They go on both exchanging blows back and forth and at first, it's just Vegeta countering Goku's completely readable moves. He punches him in the gut and then sends him away. This isn't like you at all Kakarot. Stop screwing around Vegeta screams. And he was right. Goku's moves were limited to straight punches and kicks. Seeing this, Whis more or less kinda understood what's going on. Vegeta-sama, I think you shouldn't provoke him. The man you are fighting right now is not Goku, we says. What do you mean, Vegeta asks. Consider this, he continues. There is a great weapon capable of taking millions of lives. Would you rather let it be in the hands of an evil dictator or an ignorant child? Hearing this, Vegeta pretty much understood what Whis meant now. At least in the case of an evil dictator, there might be room for negotiation. Okay, so how do we get him back how he was, says Vegeta. Honestly, I have no idea, Whis responds. I didn't want to believe it, but after looking at the situation firsthand, it's honestly more complicated than I feared. The way Goku is now, he's like Zeno-sama. I see, so... He needs someone who can properly keep him in check, Vegeta asks, just like the Grand Priest is to Zenosama. Perhaps, that's the only way to keep him from going wild. We can also ask Zenosama to take care of this matter, but Vegeta, you wouldn't want that, do you? Of course not. We don't need outside help to keep the balance of our universe, says Vegeta with a lethal glare in his eyes. By this point, Omni Goku had braced himself even more for what's coming. He rushes towards Vegeta and Vegeta decides to block him like usual, but unlike before, Goku readjusts his posture at the last second and hits Vegeta in the gut with a powerful kick. Oh, uh, so your body still remembers everything. Right, Kakarot, Vegeta says. Vegeta-sama, I've already asked you not to provoke him. If he decides to use that same power again, you'll be erased out of existence, we says. Let's stop fighting and try to converse with him. The way Omni Goku was just able to learn and improve his fighting style on the spot though hints that this individual can still be reasoned with. It's maturing, we says. You say that, but should a god of destruction really be resorting to such cowardly ways? I'll put him in place. Plus, if I'm not using any energy blast, then maybe he won't get any ideas to use them either. It's straight hand-to-hand -hand combat from here on out, Vegeta says. Saying this, Vegeta transforms into Ultra Ego and sends Omni Goku flying with an outburst of just his energy alone, shockwaves leveling the battlefield. Unfortunately, this may have been an absolutely terrible call because when Omni Goku sees Vegeta radiate so much light and energy, it causes a strange sort of agitation within him. He tries to mimic exactly what Vegeta does and simply unleashes a tremendous amount of energy in all directions. Normally something like this would have triggered a Super Saiyan transformation, but this was a different case. Instead, he envelops himself in a bright luminous aura, something that was more radiating than the stars beside them. This aura was pure white and once again triggered a reaction in the Grand Priest. For the sake of context, this is Goku's actual Omni Goku form. It is still imperfect though and it looks like it'll take quite a while before Omni Goku's new birth will reach full maturity. Meanwhile, while all of this is going on, the guys from Universe 12 were already wandering around in Universe 7. That is, until Omni Goku's transformation. Ah, so that's where it is, says Zenith. Alright, let's go guys. Looks like the person in question isn't that far. Oh man, it's about time, Kaoru says. And soon enough, we'll get to enact our revenge. The Grand Priest will pay for what he did to our comrades. Yeah, I still can't believe he made Zeno erase entire universes, says Amarok. Well, as long as Zeno exists, we can't even bring our brothers back using the power of Super Shinron, says Zenith. But now, almost as if a gift from the gods themselves, a symbol of rebellion is born in the form of Omni Goku. 
We might have waited for millions of years, but it was all worth it. Now, if only we can make this symbol join our side, says Kakura. Meanwhile, back at the battlefield, Omni Goku takes a stance. And seeing this, Vegeta knew that things might have already gotten out of hand because that pose is Kakarot's signature stance. With powers comparable to even what the Grand Priest is able to do and the unpredictability of Kid Buu, the multiverse is on a time limit to get Omni Goku under control before he completely loses it, but it seems like he's already being targeted by multiple groups. After exchanging blow after blow with Vegeta, Omni Goku's body instinctively starts remembering his own martial arts style, and then suddenly Omni Goku takes Goku's signature fighting stance and charges straight towards Vegeta. But regardless of the situation or the possibility that their universe itself might get erased out of existence, Vegeta couldn't help but let out his usual battle smile. Both Saiyans exchange blows. It's an absolute slugfest of the highest tier right now, just punches and kicks because Omni Goku still has yet to realize that he can also use energy blast in combat. Meanwhile, Goku's earlier energy outburst gave the Universe 12 warriors their cue. They were currently a dozen or so galaxies away, hurrying up anxiously. Say, Amarok, when was the last time you actually had a duel anyway? Zenith asked sincerely. Come on, you know the answer. I sealed my powers after that humiliating defeat by the Grand Priest on that day. Amarok lets out his frustration. I know how you feel, Amarok. I, I really do. It's the same for me, Katara adds. The current balance of the multiverse must be destroyed. We should be the ones to do it, not my brother. It must be us. Well, anyways, Zenith continues, I asked you this because it looks like it's finally time for you to unseal your dormant powers. I sense a strong presence approaching us. But the instant he finishes this sentence, a horrifying punch lands across Amarok's face and sends him flying straight into a black hole. This was where the warriors encountered a certain ominous individual, someone who had been training desperately ever since he realized the true extent of the power gap between him and those Saiyans. Someone who completely destroyed his own understanding of his own power and discovered a newfound strength, a body entrenched in platinum. That's right, the one who stood right in front of those legendary warriors from Universe 12 was none other than Platinum Frieza, the return of the Emperor in a new transformation. Perfect timing, Frieza says. I wanted to test the potential of this new transformation immediately. However, the warriors knew that they couldn't waste any more time, especially since time is relative, and if they miss their chance, it'll be the end. Meanwhile, even though it's been a little more than 12 hours since Omni Goku destroyed the sun, a week has passed back on Earth. Organic life forms have crumbled, and the world has turned into a dark dystopia. All of the Z Fighters gather at the lookout, and Piccolo begins to explain exactly what happened, while Oob and Boo are still unconscious. Gohan is distraught himself as he and the other Z Fighters know full well that Goku would never do such a thing. But before they could contemplate what to do about Goku, they have to summon Shenron and wish the sun back into existence. Of course, gathering the Dragon Balls was hardly a challenge for our Z Fighters and surprisingly enough, everyone had already brought whatever ball they could find. Only one ball was left and it was one in the possession of Bulma. She was already quite busy in trying to create an artificial energy source for the planet together with the help of other scientists, so she sends five-year-old Bulla in her stead. Now, going back to the Goku and Vegeta battle, Whis was going to stop Vegeta from letting Omni Goku improve and mature even more, but that's when he realized something. The reason Vegeta was so focused on fighting is exactly because he doesn't want Goku to cause any more irreparable damage especially not the kind that'll get the Grand Priest involved. If they have to keep fighting forever, then so be it. He'd rather keep fighting for all eternity than let someone else handle the matter of their universe. Both of them have limitless energy after all. Though what ultimately did disrupt the rhythmic nature of their fight was indeed that outside force, or should I say the indication of an outside force. Even if Goku was not the same, he could never have forgotten that familiar presence. As he became more conscious of what was going on in his surroundings, he senses something really familiar. Vegeta uses the opportunity to land a solid blow on his face, but Goku comes to a standstill and blocks the fist. But following this block, he faces another direction and lets out a lethal wave of a scream. 
a scream that ignores the laws of physics and traverses through space similar to what Majin Buu did back in the day. Both Vegeta and Whis could see clearly that this wave of a scream was headed in a very specific direction and they also knew exactly who it would eventually come into contact with. The legendary Super Saiyan Broly. The man who had been training himself to the bones ever since the defeat by Gogeta Blue. Broly stops the shockwave right before it hits the planet he was on, immediately letting out his own Saiyan battle cry and blitzing himself in the direction that the wave came from. His excitement couldn't be contained anymore. Now you've done it, Kakarot. I'm not here to babysit all of you sane commoners, Vegeta says, getting really annoyed at this point. Back on Earth, Bola had brought the final Dragon Ball and Shenron would be summoned. Dende gulps and this is when he asks him to bring the sun back, but for some reason, Shenron says that he can't. He simply states that this is beyond his power. When asked why, Shinron would ask them if this inquiry is just their first wish. Consequently, Whis, who momentarily observed the situation using his orb, relays what's happening on Earth to Vegeta. Though Vegeta knows his wife and the others will figure out what to do somehow, so he continues to keep Goku in check. Gohan decides that, well, they don't even know how the sun was destroyed in the first place, so maybe they should use their first wish to ask Shinron what exactly happened to the sun. When Shinron answers, this is when he would reveal something absolutely shocking. The sun was erased by the Omni King. That power is absolute, he goes on. And if he himself even tries to bring back the sun, he'll instantly suffer the same fate. Therefore, he suggests asking Super Shinron for the wish instead. The Omni King? My father, Gohan asks, taken aback. Subsequently, Bulma's team was done creating the artificial sun as she contacts Trunks, who is already at the lookout, and tells them that they should request that Shenron put the artificial sun in the sun's place and also increase his diameter by several thousand folds. Shenron does just that, and so they regain their source of energy throughout the universe. As for the remaining wish, Dende asks Shenron to revive all of the organic life, plants, animals, and humans who couldn't survive the aftermath of the sun's disappearance. And this, for the moment at least, would take care of their situation. Gohan would then set his sights on the distant twitching star, as he knows that his father is somewhat near that star, but the question is, how can he get there himself? Damn it, I shouldn't have wasted that first wish, Gohan says. Hey, Piccolo says, confronting Gohan with an overwhelming glare in his eyes. Think clearly for a second, Gohan. Do you really think this is a battle that you yourself can step into? Piccolo knew that they should leave this matter to Vegeta. There's not much that they could do about it anyway. By this point, Broly would have gone on to reach the side of the battle. He stares at Omni Goku while Goku stares back. Vegeta didn't want Broly complicating things even more as the irritation gets the better of him and he instinctively uses his ultimate final flash to blast Broly several galaxies away. This does work, especially considering how he didn't even give Broly any room to dodge, but of course, this wasn't nearly enough to take Broly out. All it did was send him on a voyage across the galaxies. And it only is after Vegeta was done unleashing all of that final flash that he realized that he had committed a terrible mistake. Now, what would happen if Goku were try to mimic him and do the same? And of course, Goku does just that, mimicking Vegeta's attack, but right before he could start concentrating his energy, Vegeta turns ruthless as he charges in and lands a devastating blow on Goku's arms, hence in turn, rendering them useless for a while, but he doesn't stop there. Vegeta has had absolutely enough of this. He continues landing heavy blow after blow on all of Goku's weak spots without letting him catch a single breath. Meanwhile, Platinum Frieza was engaging in heavy combat himself with Karura of Universe 12. Both sides were pretty evenly matched, which of course, triggered an insane, almost irrational amount of rage within Frieza. In his mind, he was infuriated by how he's evenly matched against a random nobody, completely unaware that Katara is actually a legendary existence who defeated the previous god of destruction of Universe 12. Time passed and eventually people began to refer to him as a myth, but Katara's legend was real, and the fact that Frieza can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him is nothing short of incredible either. 
Tomarok still hasn't come back out of that black hole, by the way, while Zenith was simply observing the situation from afar. Frieza wonders if he should provoke Katara by attacking his companions, and so he unleashes a powerful blast on Zenith, but Zenith ends up absorbing the blast effortlessly. Frieza wanted to provoke them, but ended up getting provoked instead. Though if even this wasn't enough, right when he charges ahead to attack Katara again, someone comes flying and hits Frieza like a truck. It's Broly, and for the already humiliated Frieza, a Saiyan was the last thing he wanted to see right now. Interestingly enough, that nearby black hole implodes, and out comes Amarok with his unleashed powers. Now, in that very instant, it was Katara, the man who defeated the previous god of destruction of Universe 12, Amarok, a broken warrior who sealed his powers after suffering a huge loss against the Grand Priest, Zenith, an enigma who was easily able to absorb Platinum Frieza's sinister blast, and Frieza, in his new platinum form, something that he specifically came up with for the sole purpose of overpowering Goku's Ultra Instinct. And then of course, the wild card would be Broly the Legendary Super Saiyan. Last time, it took both Goku and Vegeta fusing together and using the Super Saiyan Blue transformation before they could win against Broly's legendary Ikari form. He spent years training himself to death ever since, and now there's no telling where he stands in terms of strength. Meanwhile, Vegeta has been constantly punching and kicking Goku ever since, just going completely ballistic. The sheer uncertainty of what may happen if Goku were to catch a breath was reason enough to keep hitting him. Lord Vegeta, I don't want to disturb your disciplining session, but looks like we have a few interesting intruders, we says. At this rate, I wonder if other universes will also decide to get involved. Seriously, why can't they all just mind their business, Vegeta replies. Going back to the Universe 12 Warriors, this is when Broly charges straight in and tries to punch Amarok straight in the gut. Surprisingly enough, Amarok doesn't even attempt to dodge it or even block it. Not because he's overconfident, but because it's a part of his warrior code to always let the opponent land the first blow. Which, that's, that's pretty honorable, I guess. But that's how he gauges their strength. And in this case, he instantly acknowledges Broly and went all out from the get-go. <laughs> I don't think Amarok could have asked for a better opponent to regain his fighting prowess in the comments on the fighting between Broly and Amarok. Two just complete beasts trying to hunt each other. Frieza recalls how easily he got wrecked by Broly even though he was using his golden Frieza form, but never again, so he braces himself to confront Broly right there and then. But Katara gets in the way as this is a 1v1 fight. He doesn't want Frieza disrupting his comrade's duel. Zenith on the other hand tells both of them that he'll be going on ahead. No doubt about it, he goes on. The Grand Priest and Zeno will eventually come to this universe. This isn't something that they can ignore any longer. Find your groove and defeat these two. We'll rendezvous at the location of the new Omni King. Good luck, guys. And this is when he parts ways with Amarok and Katara and goes on ahead. Roger that, both of them respond. And back on Earth, Gohan hasn't given up on going up there to see what's happening with his father. What was the point of all of that rigorous training if I can't even be there when it counts, he says, expressing himself right in front of Piccolo. And it wasn't his words or logic that got through the Piccolo. It was the glint and determination in his eyes. Piccolo knew he couldn't talk him out of going, so he decides to just tag along with Gohan instead. Now, if only they could figure out how to get up there still. Back at Zeno's palace, both Zeno and the future Zeno were playing cards when they're interrupted by the Grand Priest. I apologize for interrupting your game, Master Zeno, but it looks like there is a matter at hand which cannot be ignored. Your status has just been put in jeopardy, he says. A new Omni King has been born. As for Vegeta's constant assault on Omni Goku, it was about time that Omni Goku got bored and tried to find a way out of the situation. By this point, however, he had more so realized how Vegeta is kind of afraid of his erasing technique. So within the momentary space between Vegeta's one blow and another, Omni Goku would unleash a miniature version of the move he used to erase the sun on Vegeta. This, of course, stops Vegeta in his tracks and allows Goku to finally brace himself. However, the crystal clear indication that Vegeta was indeed scared of Omni Goku's erasing technique didn't sit right with him at all. It actually triggered a mental dilemma, making Vegeta wonder if a god of destruction, or rather, 
if a proud Saiyan warrior such as himself should really even be afraid of such an attack. He better get over it soon because Goku on the other hand would use this opportunity he had created for himself to concentrate his energy within his hands. Even though he wasn't verbally saying the name, it was an attack that Vegeta knew all too well. Goku's signature move, being prepared with an energy that he himself didn't know how to compete with at the moment. A galaxy trembling, limit shattering Kamehameha, being prepared by the new Omni King. Vegeta continuing to keep Omni Goku from going rogue, Platinum Frieza and Broly engage in a ferocious battle against the warriors of Universe 12. Their leader, Zenith, is on his way to Omni Goku. Gohan and Piccolo are still on Earth trying to figure out how they can get to Goku while the Grand Priest is finally ready to pay Universe 7 a visit together with Zeno. Definitely be sure to go check out those previous parts if you guys need more context. Anyways, for now, as much as the Grand Priest wanted Zeno to get up, neither one of them budged as their card game was going a bit too fun for them to just up and leave, so the Grand Priest is left with no choice but to just wait it out. Meanwhile, Gohan and Piccolo are quickly trying to figure out a way to get to the scene as well. Gohan has continuously been training ever since the Tournament of Power 5 years ago and he was finally going to spar with his father to show him the fruits of his labor but who knew that an event of this scale would happen so suddenly? Not only that, Goku just so happens to be the center of it all like always. Though while Gohan was deep in thought, Piccolo realizes that Dende has been quite freaked out ever since he saw Goku destroy the sun. What's wrong Dende? Look, we've got a new son instead, Piccolo says, assuring him. Dende pauses for a second, nods, and then looks at Piccolo with a sincere expression in his eyes. Listen, Piccolo, I'm not sure if you've heard about it, but the Namekian Book of Legends has two testaments. The old one was mostly just myths and fables, so throughout the centuries it got revised and we ended up with copies of a shorter, abridged version. One that holds knowledge exclusive to Universe 7. Piccolo goes completely silent momentarily, but what triggered this reaction was Nail's memories lying dormant in his subconsciousness. He instantly realized why Dende was in such peril. The existence of another Omni King simply proves that the stories, the myths, and the fables were, in reality, the true history of the multiverse. All that utterly inconceivable stuff actually happened millions of years ago. Wait, where is the Old Testament right now, Piccolo says. Don't tell me it got blown away when Frieza destroyed Old Namek. Piccolo is seeming desperate at this point, and of course this conversation has completely swayed Gohan's attention as well. I I'm not sure, though thinking rationally, when Grand Elder Guru passed away, he must have passed down the only known copy of the Old Testament to my brother Mori. Dende replies, he simply had no idea as even the Grand Elder treated them as nothing more than fantastical stories. However, this event and the ones that preceded it, all of them are undeniable proof of the book's credibility. Gohan, we have to go get to New Namek first. I highly doubt that such a historical treasure wasn't preserved, Piccolo says. Come on, at least do instant transmission, didn't Goku at least teach you that much? Yeah, you don't have to tell me, Gohan says, expressing his frustration. Darn it, why can't I be useful for once? Meanwhile, back at the battlefield, Omni Goku had charged a massive, almost diabolical amount of energy for his Kamehameha. He wasn't Goku enough, per se, to verbally call out the name, but as he was about to unleash it, Vegeta could barely see his lip movement spelling out the name. Vegeta actually goes on to let out a little smirk and then follows up on Omni Goku's Kamehameha with a final flash of equal magnitude. It's a collision whose waves could be felt all the way by Gohan back on Earth and it also gave Zenith the exact coordinates on where exactly this new Omni King is supposed to be. Vegeta-sama, what are you doing? If that Kamehameha was imbued with that erase ability, your attack and you yourself would have been deleted on the spot, we says, trying to knock some sense into Vegeta for being so careless. I know what you mean, it's just that I had a feeling that it would be the plain old Kamehameha, right Kakarot, Vegeta says? Though it was just a hunch, there was indeed some merit to Vegeta's reasoning here. It was when he saw Kakarot's body, 
His lips physically spell out the characters for Kamehameha that Vegeta instinctively knew there was no need for cheap gimmicks. Let's duke it out with our own strength. Though suffice to say, this had only increased Omni Goku's maturity because now, not only is he going to keep using Kamehameha's, his body's also going to start speaking soon enough. Looks like I'm in for quite the haul here, Vegeta says to himself as his concentration keeps getting sharper and sharper and so does his final flash. And this is when Murphy's Law begins to kick in. Vegeta had yet to realize the true extent of the danger posed by this legendary existence before him. Omni Goku had indeed tried to imbue Erasure in that Kamehameha. What happened was Goku's own body created this polarizing effect that ended up separating those two energies and lined them up in a queue. That's right, the moment the clash between Final Flash and Kamehameha is over, a sudden outburst of a race of energy will emerge as the aftermath to that attack. It would undoubtedly erase Vegeta and then go on to do the same to half of the universe that stood right behind him. Neither Vegeta nor Whis had any idea that the greatest tragedy in the history of Universe 7 was but only a few moments away. But for the slightly matured Omni Goku, he was just patiently anticipating what kind of face this purple candle in front of him would make before it's completely blown out of existence. Sadly, Omni Goku still had no idea about the true implication of what it means to completely erase something out of existence. Halfway through the final flash, Vegeta's heightened awareness finally realizes that there's a little bit more to this Kamehameha than what appears to be on the surface. Whis would go on to become confused as well as neither of them could explain it, but this Kamehameha felt incomplete. Vegeta bets it all on his gut instinct and uses everything he had. All the energy his Ultra Ego form could accumulate and he also adds in Hakai as the little cherry on top as well. Both energies intertwine with each other and begin to actively destroy Omni Goku's Kamehameha but what it did was only escalate the inevitable. Omni Goku would smirk as the Kamehameha's original essence gets diminished and what emerges at the end is the greatest surge of energy Vegeta and Whis had ever seen. Wait, what? For the first time in forever, Vegeta was quite literally lost for words and so was Whis. There was nothing they could do because what appeared before them was a gigantic flash of light. A Kamehameha wave so big that it inadvertently stripped the black holes of their dark matter. The section of the universe that stood behind Vegeta was about to be reduced to a chapter in a history book. Whis quickly secures his safety by relocating and calls out to Vegeta. Vegeta quickly get out of there. It's fundamentally impossible to evade that attack. I know, Vegeta says. Damn it. Then it all just happens too quickly. All of his insecurities about being afraid of this Omni King's strength, the mental dilemmas, the fear, and the idea that there was nothing he could do about it. All of it hits Vegeta like a truck all at once. He's exasperated while his pupils turn white, that menacing purple aura of Ultra Ego simply fading away and his life starts flashing before his eyes as the attack grows closer. In that moment, it wasn't his body or his energy that gave away, but it was his mind. His greatest final flash imbued with Akai got blown out like a flame on a candle. All of these thoughts ran and re-ran throughout Vegeta's head, all in the span of mere seconds. He may or may not be able to get out of the way, but Vegeta knew. The main target of this diabolical Kamehameha was definitely him. If he were to move to the other side, the Kamehameha could come around and hit Earth. And so silently, yet courageously, Vegeta would go on admitting defeat as he closes his eyes and simply stands in the way of this nightmare as it homes in. In his final moment, in his blaze of glory, Vegeta chose to at least accept his demise like a warrior. Meanwhile, not just Universe 7, the entire multiverse could more or less feel the impending doom. Zenith bites his lip, devastated that history is going to repeat itself all over again. However, this attack would have much greater ramifications as the Grand Priest's expression changes to a lot more of an unpleasant one now, while the Omni King duo couldn't help but pause their game as well. However, that momentary instance between the inception of the Kamehameha could only last so long. And just like that, it hit Vegeta and simply imploded, or should I say the Kamehameha imploded itself out of existence the moment it hit Vegeta, leaving everyone and 
everything lost for words as to what just happened. That sudden surge of light which was going to envelop half of the universe just up and disappeared. Leaving everyone at a loss for words as across the 12 universes and beyond in this singular moment, there was extreme silence as if reality itself had come to a standstill with everyone's jaw dropped but then someone breaks that silence with a laugh. Omni Goku started laughing hysterically as his laughter filled the void that was created by the silence of everyone else. This situation had gone beyond common sense at this point as just now, one man, a Saiyan, trolled and pranked everyone in the multiverse, the Grand Priest and Zeno included it seems like. One can only imagine how Vegeta must have felt during this because not only did he have to go through the situation but he also seems to be the butt of Omni Goku's bizarre joke here. And seeing what just happened, how Vegeta was ready to accept defeat and stood tall as a proud Saiyan warrior, yet it was all just a sick joke by Omni Goku as he continued to laugh. Vegeta lost it. For a warrior such as prideful and proud as him, this was the greatest humiliation possible. He couldn't care less about what may happen to him or the universe. He simply loses it. All those pent up emotions, the fear, the doubt, they become unnecessary in that moment. Vegeta would end up losing consciousness. The light emitting from the nearby stars, the moons and different wavelengths of energy emitting from them reignite the primate Saiyan's essence which had long since been lying dormant within his body and thus he somehow begins to transform into the Saiyan ape. But that was just the start of what was to come next. The other thing that got triggered was Vegeta's ultra ego state. Omni Goku's joke had completely violated Vegeta's ego and made it fade away. And yet, it had been completely reborn in that moment. The great ape Vegeta had turned into begins to let out lethal amounts of aura. Ultra ego aura to be more precise. And then, almost as if Vegeta's Saiyan disposition had won over his title as the new god of destruction, both forms begin to overlap until all that's left of the great ape is a silhouette and what stands in front of Goku is a Saiyan who has actively let his rage transcend past everything. See this Kakarot? Unlike you, I don't need cheap gimmicks to defeat you. This is my peak, he goes on. The final stage in my evolution as a proud Saiyan warrior. I think I'll coin this state Omega Vegeta. By this time, Omni Goku had completely stopped laughing. The joke was over, plus now something else had piqued his attention as well. Seeing Vegeta's newly heightened state was about as exciting as this could get. He warps through time and lands a stellar blow on Omni Goku's gut, which in turn adds another chapter to the history books. The day the Omni King felt pain. Circumstances be damned, Kakarot. I no longer care what happens to me or this universe. Let's find out once and for all who's the strongest. This kick started the greatest battle since the inception of Universe 7. Goku, a man of ordinary birth, ordinary talent, nothing spectacular about him whatsoever, yet through effort alone, he transcended past his limits and attained strength similar to that of the angels at this point. Maybe it's not only by mere coincidence that the multiverse chose or rather cursed him to be the next Omni King. And then we have Vegeta, born of royalty and with extraordinary potential since birth. And yet circumstances destroyed his planet and his people. Left with nothing more than his pride as a Saiyan, the man continued on, changed, redeemed himself, pushed through again and again. Though no matter how hard he tried or what he did, he was always just a tiny step behind Goku. However, in the end, the one who stepped up and reached the pinnacle of his existence wasn't Goku, it was Vegeta. Him gaining such power wasn't a result of some mere coincidence or random occurrence. No, the man chose himself and attained strength that could no longer be placed in a tear. Even though the fate of the entire multiverse was lying on this battle, neither of them cared more or less. They'd rather just duke it out and see whose punch is stronger once and for all. But back at Zeno's palace, the Grand Priest had finally lost it. He flips up the table of cards and glares at both Zeno, saying, we are leaving immediately. That's all he had to say to make them both realize just how serious this matter was. And it's shortly thereafter that the Grand Priest and the Zeno duo leave for Universe 7. 
It would take them two days to traverse the multiverse, but then they can get to Goku and Vegeta instantly. It's pretty clear that the Grand Priest is regretting not leaving sooner because after what has already transpired because of this new Omni King, it might already be too late by the time they get there. The multiverse may very well be about to enter a new age or completely crumble before their very eyes. Meanwhile, Omni Goku can't keep up with Omega Vegeta at all. The new Omni King? Don't make me laugh, Vegeta goes on. From where I'm standing, you aren't even half as strong as what Kakarot used to be, he says, landing a seventh consecutive blow across Omni Goku's face, erasing reality. I don't think that power needs to exist, Vegeta continues, as he speaks his mind with every blow he lands. And now that Omni Goku is genuinely feeling pain, he starts preparing another attack that will envelop solely Vegeta and Vegeta alone this time. Yet another one of those cheap gimmicks. I'm ready, come on. Throw it, Kakarot, or should I say Omni Kakarot, as Vegeta just taunts the mess out of Goku right now. On the sidelines, Whis has been completely silent for a while now, maybe because he thinks that this situation doesn't need his narration, but seeing Vegeta actively provoke Omni Goku into sending an erasure blast his way, hasn't this gone too far, Lord Vegeta, he thinks to himself? But this is when Vegeta does something that is supposed to be impossible. As the erasure bomb is unleashed right upon him, Omega Vegeta punches a hole in the momentary space between himself and the attack. This creates a discrepancy that causes the bomb to disappear from the known universes and into the abyss of the higher dimensions. It doesn't matter who it is or where that power came from. Deep down, Vegeta's goal has always been surpassing Kakarot, and that's exactly what he planned on doing. As at that very moment, status no longer matters. Omega Vegeta has somehow come out on top in an impossible situation, overcoming not only Goku, his greatest rival, but overcoming the power of the Omni King as well. The ferocious battle between Katara and Platinum Frieza was pretty much going nowhere at the current point in time. Partially because Frieza's relentless obscenity met an almost unbreakable serenity. Katara had faced a lot of interesting opponents throughout his lifetime, and yet, it was Frieza, the self-proclaimed Emperor of Universe 7, who was making this one interesting in particular. Not only because of the peculiar manner in which he was fighting Katara, but also because as much as he was focused on their battle, he was also just as curious about the one going on right beside them. Yeah, despite being in the face of a serene warrior who had quite literally defeated a god of destruction a long time ago, Frieza couldn't help but be frustrated at how much progress Broly had made in such a short amount of time. Almost as if the limits of his own potential were becoming loud and clear now. Katara couldn't help but become curious about it as well. Hey, if you're that interested in that berserk monkey guy, then go right ahead and fight him. It'll save me and Amarok a lot of trouble, Katara says, just kinda being honest here. Frieza responds telling them to shut up and with a loud battle cry, dashes forward once again. This is when we return to the battle between Omni Goku and Omega Vegeta, and another visitor has just arrived on the scene as well. We seems rather concerned even though the battle has mostly been one-sided since the moment Vegeta let out this new ability. He knew the Grand Priest and Zeno were on their way, but that was to be expected. What caught him off guard the most was how casually Vegeta let out an attack from the Omni King into a realm of the higher dimension somewhere. Uh, Lord Vegeta, do you have any idea where those erase bombs are heading to? He firmly questions. No, as a matter of fact, I don't. And frankly, at the moment, I don't really care. Why do you ask? Vegeta replies, while delicately dodging 12 of Omni Goku's consecutive punches in a row. Whis didn't really have much to go on with, so he instead chose to stay quiet. And yet, right then, a certain individual appears on the scene right in the midst of their battle. It's Zenith. The leader of the warriors from Universe 12 coming to hunt down Omni Goku. A walking enigma. Yo, you guys remind me of Yamoshi, he says, while suddenly popping up right between Goku and Vegeta and just casually stopping their fight. But right before either Vegeta or Whis could say anything about the situation, he continues his comment. I've been waiting for you, Omni King. I'm glad I made it here before the Grand Priest. The most astonishing part about all of this was how easily it had caught them all off guard. There was no sense of presence around this individual whatsoever. It was a completely dark shell of a being. 
almost as if it's someone who isn't supposed to exist. An anomaly. Just what the hell are you, Vegeta says, breaking the silence. Wait, are you the god of destruction of this universe by any chance? Zenith asks, dodging the question with a question of his own after a momentary silence. Meanwhile, back on Earth, Piccolo is trying to use the memories he had of the time Nail went to Yardrat to somehow learn the instant transmission technique. It's not that easy, especially considering how Nail never learned the technique himself, he just watched a few Yardrat kids learning it from their elder. Gohan, on the other hand, goes all the way back to Bulma together with Trunks, Goten, and Bulla to see if she knows a way to contact Whis. They might be able to ask them to transport them to Namek. While Whis' attention was completely swayed by the emergence of this mysterious being in front of them, and the fight had come to a standstill, even Omni Goku's mood was swayed at this point. Subsequently, both Oob and Majin Buu have finally woken up from their brutal migraine in the middle of the night. They can't recall anything about what happened prior, but are in an awful state, both physically and mentally. This fellow Majin Buu was about to start having some severe candy withdrawals following that migraine, but then something in the starry dark skies catches his attention. Going back to the battlefield where Zenith has appeared now, it's been a little more than three minutes since he showed up and has yet to speak anything about himself yet. Omni Goku was instinctively curious at first, but since the situation was going nowhere, he simply chose to just erase this nuisance whoever he is and go back to getting beat up by Omega Vegeta. So he casually unleashes an erase blast at Zenith and then dashes right towards Vegeta. Vegeta himself was definitely annoyed by this odd individual and couldn't have cared less if he got erased or not at this point. Needless to say, he was still very curious if someone who so sneakily stopped two lethal blows from them could actually evade that erase attack. And so the moment Omni Goku is about to land a drop kick, Vegeta instead lands a kick on Goku's face instead while the erase bomb completely envelops in it. However, Vegeta is shocked as Goku bears the weight of his attack and returns his kick. The real reason why he was shocked, however, is because that erase blast completely bypassed this individual and proceeded to hit a nearby barren planet. Zena didn't just evade the attack or dodge it, rather, it was as if he himself was never there to begin with. This is followed by a hysterical laugh from the individual as he says, Viola, this is it. This is what we were looking for now. Now then, how should I take you back with us? Hold on. You're not from this universe, are you? Vegeta asks while gently tapping on his shoulder from behind. Exactly right, or let's just say, I don't belong to any of the universes anymore, Zenith replies. What's that supposed to mean, Vegeta says, asking a pretty fair question, but once again, he gets no sincere reply. Ordinarily, he would have taken out this individual, but maybe it's because of his position as the God of Destruction, but Vegeta is very keen on handling the matters of his universe by himself. He's no longer as flippant as he was while telling Omni Goku that circumstances be damned because deep down, Vegeta has already accepted that there's no longer a way out of this situation even after Omni Goku has been subdued. So he'll take full responsibility for everything that's happened. That's exactly why Goku must regain his sanity once again, otherwise, who will protect the universe after he's gone? Vegeta was indeed no longer the kind of person who will discard consequences without a second thought. In his mind, no matter what kind of situation may befall them, he'll take full responsibility himself. Or if worse comes to worse, Vegeta and Vegeta alone has resolved to go up against even the Grand Priest or Zeno if need be. Zenith on the other hand is being awfully bizarre about this whole situation. His behavior is totally different from his companions as there is no serenity, maturity, or calm whatsoever about him. It's all too strange for even Vegeta to process instantly. Whis, you've been quiet for a while now. Don't tell me you know what the hell this thing is, Vegeta asks Whis. Oh, I apologize, Lord Vegeta. I was just checking out the situation on Earth, and it looks like your wife and the others have been trying to contact me for a while now, Whis frantically replies. Vegeta pauses for a second and wonders if something has gone wrong and then replies, Fine then, go and have a look. I'll manage things here. Following this command, Whis takes his leave and teleports to Earth. Meanwhile, Vegeta now has to deal with both Zenith and Omni Goku. Things were hefty as they were, but now there's this added dilemma of Zenith's identity. Can Omega Vegeta really handle the both of them at once? Back at the Broly vs. Amarok fight, 
it's a back and forth struggle for supremacy among the two beasts. Both are exhibiting remarkable auras, however the battle could only go on for so much longer. Amarok has finally regained his suppressed powers through continuous fighting now. Frieza observes as this demonic warrior lands a stupendous blow on Broly's gut, one that sends a fearsome ripple throughout the galaxy and knocks him unconscious. You have to learn to control your rage, my brother, Amarok says as his parting words. He had fully acknowledged Broly's strength though. Seeing this, Frieza is exasperated. He had thrown that dog straight into the black hole. Not only did it come back, but he also actually is stronger than Broly now? Well, looks like their fight's over. Alright, time for us to get serious as well, Kara comments and charges ahead to land the finishing blow on Frieza. While Amarok is standing by waiting for them to finish so that he and Kara can go see their leader. But as for Frieza, he completely flips. Frieza curses all of them, saying how he trained himself to the bone and finally achieved the golden Frieza form to defeat those Super Saiyans, but then they went ahead and surpassed that already. Then he trained himself even harder to attain a power that can rival that Goku's Ultra Instinct and finally achieved Platinum Frieza. It was supposed to be his return. Goku, Vegeta, Broly, Beerus, he was going to show them all who the true Emperor of the Universe was. It was supposed to be him. So you're telling me this still isn't enough, he goes on. Even after coming this far, I'll be defeated before even getting to challenge Goku? Frieza begins going insane and he's honestly going so ham that he wakes up Broly. Whoa, that's a lot of frustration, man. I feel sorry for you, but that's got nothing to do with us, Kotaro replies. But Frieza's rage was much too difficult to quell at this moment. He notices Broly is awake once again, ignores his own battle, and charges straight ahead towards Broly instead. However, right before his punch could come in contact with Broly's face, he instinctively dodges it and lands a counter on Frieza instead. Uh, well... What do you say, Kara? Looks like they're no longer interested in fighting with us, Amarok asks. Yeah, it was fun, but let's not disturb them any further. I do appreciate them for helping warm us up before we face the Grand Priest and Zeno, though. Kara says, then briefly pauses for a second and firmly states, Alright, let's go. And so, the two warriors hurry to join their leader in the confrontation against the new Omni King. They will then prepare to start a rebellion against both Zeno and the Grand Priest. These guys no longer had any reason to hold back. Subsequently, Frieza doesn't let up and forces the enraged Akari form out of Broly and engages in a heightened battle for supremacy now. But Broly is feeling kinda strange ever since he was knocked unconscious. Or rather, was he ever even knocked unconscious at all? Whis, on the other hand, has finally appeared back on Earth, but Piccolo still hasn't mastered the instant transmission, despite training inside the hyperbolic time chamber for days. So, why were you calling me here all of a sudden, Boma-san? Whis asks patiently. No, it wasn't me, she replies. It looks like Gohan here needs your help with something. I don't really know what's going on with Goku, but he better shape up soon. And where's Vegeta? He didn't even pay us a visit when the sun was destroyed. I was working desperately to create an artificial sun the entire time, Boma says, going just on a complete rant right now. Oh, didn't he tell you? He's the new god of destruction of Universe 7, Whis casually replies, but... His reply is met with absolute shock and silence amongst everyone. There was Boma, Trunks, Bola, Goten, and of course Gohan on the scene, and all of them were taken aback. Lost for words. Nobody had any idea. Mom, what's the god of destruction, Bola asks. I'm not really too sure. You'll have to ask Papa when he returns, Boma says agitatedly, because she knows that Vegeta is now going to take even longer to come back home. Gohan then looks Whis in the eyes without saying or actually even needing to say anything because his eyes said more than enough here. So Whis replies, that's right, he's currently up there trying to discipline Son Goku. This lights up everyone's faces because obviously Vegeta will return Goku back to his former self, right? Unfortunately, the reality back at the scene of the battle was quite different. You still haven't answered who you are. I'm not going to ask you another time. Stall any further and you're dead, Vegeta says while trying to intimidate Zenith. You know, you've been awfully composed about this whole situation. Isn't a god of destruction supposed to be more hot-blooded? Just come at me already, Zenith says, finally breaking his bizarre attitude and intimidates Vegeta right back. Omni Goku, on the other hand, was quiet and silent for about 10 minutes at this point. His baby brain was trying to make sense of everything that was going on and just who this guy was now all of a sudden. He was no longer acting on impulses. 
Omni Goku was officially evolving. His senses had started to create an idea of intelligence now, and thinking so hard about it, contemplating what's going on, ended up cracking the wall separating Goku's actual intelligence and that impulsive nature of the Omni Ki. Omni Goku had finally begun maturing, but there was a breach in that wall. If Goku's own consciousness remained dominant, he'll soon regain control over his body and be able to fully embrace this Omni power all by himself. Broly, on the other hand, had already dominated and overpowered Frieza's frantic outlash. Yes, Broly had already defeated Platinum Frieza in that amount of time, and yet, the moment he won. After such a fierce battle as that, all he can do is face in a specific direction and say but one word. Kakarot. Following this, he lets his aura take shape and charges straight ahead at a level of speed that warps the universe around him and propels himself even further. He may very well make it there before Amarok and Katara. Meanwhile, Frieza's fall after Broly's final blow makes a crater on a nearby planet. He did remain conscious, however, and was about to throw another tantrum again when he realized something fundamentally crucial, and this may be the turning point of the entire series. He instantly gets flashbacks of all the times he saw Goku use Ultra Instinct and how each time he was completely silent and composed. Yeah, if you thought Frieza training for a couple months was scary, then this revelation is about to change the entire landscape of Dragon Ball in this what if sense. Completely composed, but he himself on the other hand kept lashing out and getting enraged. This was a significant piece of information that he previously chose to ignore. That's right, Frieza had finally realized that the one who was limiting him was himself. And just this simple realization may lead to the most dangerous awakening of all time. While back at the actual battlefield, Vegeta tries to attack Zenith, but it doesn't work. It's as if he's throwing punches at nothing. Though that's when Omni Goku comes and grabs Vegeta's fist. He then faces them both and asks, which of you is stronger? Goku's first few words since his inception struck a sense of fascination in Zenith, and Vegeta couldn't help but feel challenged at this point. Even so, it was but the start of what was to come next. Will the balance be maintained, or will the multiverse enter a new age now? The man at the center of the stage, Omni Goku, couldn't care less about such trivialities. He had only managed to usurp a mere fraction of Goku's own consciousness, and yet the man was already looking for a stronger opponent. Vegeta faces him and casually states, Why don't you come and test it out, Kakarot? Which one of us is stronger? Omni Goku simply thought that this statement is referring to Zenith and Vegeta himself. However, it had another meaning. It was about which one of them is stronger. Omni Goku or Omega Vegeta? Meanwhile, as this battle reaches a new peak, Gohan goes and interrupts Piccolo's training. He tells him that they have to get a move on now and he can just learn instant transmission later. This frustrates Piccolo a little because he felt as if he was almost on the verge of figuring it out before getting interrupted. They bid Dende farewell and get ready to be teleported to New Namek together with Whis. Even Goten and Trunks try tagging along but get told off by Gohan because if Majin Buu or U were to go rogue once again, no one would be able to put them back in their place. As he said this, he pointed towards Majin Buu who had been looking up at the sky the entire time. While Oob on the other hand repeatedly goes through intense migraine attacks and he's being treated by Dende. This creates a momentary pause as Goten and Trunks reminisce about the time where they trained in the hyperbolic time chamber to defeat Super Buu. Piccolo was having the same thoughts and couldn't help but feel enthralled by how much the two of them have grown since then. Now. They can entrust the planet to Goten and Trunks and be sure that they'll keep it safe no problem. So as the two of them choose to spar a little bit at the lookout, Gohan and Piccolo get themselves teleported to New Namek. The organic life seems lively, but there's tension in the air here. Furthermore, no Namekian can be seen anywhere for some reason. It's all too quiet and Piccolo has a strange feeling about this. Well then, I'll be taking my leave, we states. Now that he's carried out Vegeta's command, he's supposed to go back to the scene at once. Gohan thanks him for his help and Whis gets back. Piccolo stays somewhat silent for a while as they both stroll around through the land and then says, this way Gohan, and so they both fly towards a certain direction now. Back at the scene of the battlefield when Whis returns, he sees a bizarre yet somewhat complicated situation happening. Both Goku and Vegeta are currently trying to deal some 
any type of damage to this mysterious yet hollow presence, but Zenith isn't budging. So what exactly happened here? Well, when Vegeta provoked Omni Goku to test them both for himself, he flips and simultaneously launches energy bombs on both of them. Vegeta gracefully dodges, but the attack simply bypasses through Zenith yet again. This piques Goku's curiosity and he lets out a barrage of energy blasts. Some of them are imbued with his erasing key, some of them aren't. And following this barrage, he also unleashes a brutal Kamehameha. Also, he could get Zenith to just move slightly. Vegeta would be amused by Goku's enthusiasm and decided to join in with a final flash of his own. He positions himself in the same line as Goku and Zenith and unleashes a massive final flash so that both the final flash and Kamehameha collide at one singular point of impact and that point would be Zenith's current coordinates. Goku was basically just relying on sheer power to see if he could damage Zenith at all but Vegeta was being clever with his approach. He was gradually changing the wavelength of the energy in his final flash and not only that, he also proceeds to follow Goku's approach and adds Hakai Ki. And so finally, the man decides to go all out and instinctively uses some of his newfound Omega Ki. Neither Goku nor Vegeta had any idea about this, but the moment this Omega Ki comes into contact with a little bit of the Omni Ki that Goku had imbued in his Kamehameha, things implode. Ordinarily, Vegeta would have had to find his way around the attack by either dodging it completely or letting it out in the higher dimensions. Only this time, the point of contact happens right inside Zenith's apparent body. It's momentary at best and instantaneous at worst, but it creates this polarizing effect where the clash of energies let out a sinister looking color before completely disappearing into oblivion. The next moment, we see Zenith suffering a massive blow at the impact point. This intrigues Vegeta and Goku so much that they proceed to jump onto Zenith like one jumps onto a buffet and start trying to figure out how they managed to hurt the guy finally. And that was when we appeared at the scene. Though if you were still worried about the prior attack, as for that clash, it did trigger a silent ripple effect throughout the universe, the waves of which could also be experienced in those higher dimensions. The ripples were harmless to more or less everyone in the universe except Zenith, who was the target of those energy blasts to begin with. Zenith takes a moment to understand exactly what just happened here and then bestows a massive blow across Omni Goku's face. All he did was take his fist and punch him but the impact was astronomical and even took Vegeta off guard. Just what's up with this individual Vegeta says to himself. Omni Goku on the other hand was sent flying into space before him. Even though he was conscious, he was having trouble trying to stop himself from getting swept away. So he improvises in the moment and uses Kamehameha in the opposite direction to first stop his body and then propel himself to the opposite way with it. It was definitely no secret that at this point Omni Goku had become a full fledged fighter. He returns back to the scene but comes across a rather unexpected sight this time. Vegeta has grabbed Zenith's arm, his purple aura raging and he himself appears to be in complete control of the entire situation. Now tell me, who are you? Vegeta asks as he gets annoyed once again. Only this time he expects that answer, otherwise he has no opposition to just ripping off Zenith's arms himself. Well, an interesting one aren't you? I was trying to resolve this matter peacefully and have the new Omni King accompany me but Yes, you leave me no choice, Zenith firmly replies to Vegeta's question, and this is when he begins to gain some semblance of physical existence finally. First, he strikes a strong blow on Vegeta's hand and sets himself loose, then proceeds to exhibit finely tuned attacks on all of Vegeta's weak points. Vegeta swiftly dodges them of course and then returns the favor by landing one brutal punch in Zenith's gut, exactly where he suffered damage previously. I asked you. Who are you? Stall any longer and you'll be losing a limb for every minute, Vegeta warns Zenith. He was absolutely losing his patience by this point. Omni Goku on the other hand, saw how Zenith just suffered some damage once more. This excited the guy and just when Zenith was about to say something to Vegeta, Omni Goku dashes right in at lightning speed and lands a kick right in his gut. And that kick from Omni Goku would make it absolutely impossible for Zenith to go on any longer holding in that fart. So he let it out. 
or maybe he was just faking. Zenith tanks the attack and tries to punch Goku across the face once more, but Goku instinctively dodges it, however he does get kicked in the nuts. Omni Goku definitely felt that one, but uses it as a learning experience because that one did hurt. Subsequently, Vegeta was getting angry in the corner because Goku had just interrupted their conversation as he was finally getting somewhere with this guy. So he vents out his frustration by unleashing a final flash at Goku this time. This fight was going absolutely nowhere at this point, but right when Goku comes out of bearing the weight of that final flash, someone else enters the battle. Enraged Broly has finally arrived. As he blazes across the battlefield, both Broly and Goku begin to call out each other's names and welcome each other with a massive punch. What the hell is going on, Zenith comments. I thought Amarok was taking care of this guy. Whis and Vegeta had noticed, however, that this was the first time Omni Goku had called someone else's name. And this is when Vegeta turns his attention to Whis, asking, do you think this is a good sign at all? Well, it's supposed to be, right? Whis says, being once again ambiguous with his explanation. As for Zenith, he was beginning to get outnumbered here. All of you descendants of Yamoshi are really troublesome, you know that? You guys really leave me no choice, Zenith says this, and blitzes Goku. Vegeta knew he was going after Goku's body, judging from his earlier statements, and so he appears right in front of Zenith, actively stopping him from reaching Goku. While Goku and Broly exchange blows like wild beasts right now, they are, they are absolutely going in. Listen, God of Destruction, I don't want to get involved with any of you guys yet. Just buzz off, it's all for the sake of a better tomorrow, Zenith tries to gaslight Vegeta with. Even if the multiverse itself was on the verge of destruction and the only way to stop it was by killing Kakarot, I myself would be the one to get that job done. So stop this nonsense and answer my question from before Vegeta retaliates again. And following this taunt, Zenith finally gives in. Oh fine then, I'll tell you. I'm the older brother of the man you refer to as Zeno, and the one who was originally supposed to be the Omni King. This sends an absolute shockwave through the entire battlefield as Vegeta's body goes cold, so he can only reply what as he's taken aback. You are still alive, Whis asks, just as shocked. Of course. I wonder if your father still misses me, Zenith responds. Meanwhile, Piccolo and Gohan reach a shrine. Looks like this is where all of the Namekians are at the current moment. Both of them enter inside and witness some serious discussion going on here. The Namekians notice and greet Piccolo and Gohan with a warm welcome as the Grand Elder Mori himself stands up and properly greets Piccolo, asking how his brother Dende has been doing, to which Piccolo tells him that they really could not have asked for a better guardian. Anyways, Piccolo gets straight to the point with, what I came here to ask is if I can see the Old Testament of the Namekian Book of Legends. Hearing this, Mori just sighs for a second and then takes them inside to a completely enclosed vicinity. Right in front of them is an ancient scripture. I assume Dende must have already told you about it, Piccolo. Your concern is justified. History as we know it is happening right now. At this very moment, Mori firmly states. Piccolo quickly asks, what exactly do you mean? Well, look closely at this scripture. What do you see? Piccolo takes a look and instantly gets taken aback. The scripture was alive and writing itself. Everything that was happening with Omni Goku was being written into it in real time. Piccolo tries reading it, but he can't. It's not the same language as the actual Namekian Book of Legends. Well, how are we even supposed to read this Piccolo lashes out? Meanwhile, back at the scene, Zenith has revealed his true identity, and he wasn't going to chill around here any longer and had to apprehend Goku fast. Consequently, this is when both Amarok and Karara also arrive soon after Broly. Wait, what? Didn't I knock that guy unconscious before? Amarok says, getting confused at the sight of Broly here again, looking just fine. This is an interesting universe, isn't it? Karara chips in after his comment. Oh, finally here, are we? Alright, time to subjugate the targets, then it says, finally getting serious this time. As for Vegeta, things just keep getting more and more annoying. Meanwhile, in a different part of the universe, Frieza had learned from his defeat and was now able to be more fine-tuned with his instincts. He was getting gradually closer and closer to the true potential of his new platinum form. 
Though as much as he wants to go have another shot at any of those Saiyan monkeys, Frieza had decided to be more cautious with his approach this time, and so the man once again continues his training at least for the foreseeable future. Going back to New Namek now, we have Piccolo and Gohan who seem to be unable to read those scriptures still. Unfortunately, even Grand Elder Mori can't, so they're kinda just stuck right now. This is when Mori actually gets a pretty bright idea though, suggesting that they use the Dragon Balls as they had gathered them just recently in light of all of the events taking place. And so, just like that, Purunga is summoned. Piccolo asks him to translate the scripture and explains what's happening with Goku right now. Purunga tells them that he can only grant one wish at a time, so is it the translation of the scripture or an explanation on what's happening with Goku that they would like first? Piccolo was about to ask for the explanation when he suddenly pauses for a second and recalls how limited the information Shinron was able to give them was. This leads to Piccolo deciding to ask Purunga to simply translate the chapter on the Omni King in the Old Testament. Very well then, Purunga states, and then he proceeds to tell the origin of the Omni King. The multiverse is a sentient existence. It perpetually grows and evolves, and yet, it was this growth that was causing the balance of the multiverse to bumble. Some of it had to go. There was this fundamental need for a perfect balance, and that's when a special power was born. It was the power of the Omni King, an ability to completely annihilate reality from existence, but for it to be harnessed, an individual must have obtained the highest conceivable levels of strength. They should have an ignorant, childlike mind so that the destruction is random and isn't a result of some specific propaganda. And lastly, that individual must not neglect any universe. Over time, the first Omni King decided to appoint a god of destruction to each universe to make sure that no universe would be neglected. A transcended warrior dubbed as an angel is also tasked to accompany each of these gods of destruction. The same goes for the Omni King himself. His angel gained the moniker, the Grand Priest. Both Gohan and Piccolo as well as the rest of the Namekians are just listening so closely to Purunga right now as he drops lore bomb after lore bomb until finally, he mentions the passage on what's happening to Goku. However, he continues, the flow of time takes precedence. Whenever there is a need for the multiverse to enter a new age, a new Omni King is born. It just so happens that now is that time. There is no telling, Purunga continues. Universe 7 may very well experience another name change. It would be the second time after the Dragon God Zalama created the Super Dragon Balls. Now that Purunga had explained what he needed to and was awaiting their second wish, what could Piccolo possibly wish for now as time seems to be not only running short for God of Destruction Omega Vegeta, but Omni Goku as well as Zenith and the rest of the Universe 12 Warriors have appeared to take him captive. Piccolo and Gohan are dumbfounded after hearing Purunga's explanation on the Omni King, but there was one thing they couldn't help but wonder, and that's how this isn't something Goku would ever desire himself. All he wants to do is to keep fighting guys that are stronger than him. And yeah, their concern was indeed correct. The whole thing about the power of the Omni King sounds like a curse inflicted from the multiverse. While the two of them were lost in thought, wondering about what it means for Goku going forward, Purunga was getting kind of tired of waiting. He asked them to hurry up and state their second wish. Piccolo was going to ask about what was happening with Goku now that Purunga had translated the chapter on the Omni King, but the translation of the scripture had pretty much also explained what was happening to him. So now in just a couple of moments, Piccolo and Gohan have to decide what kind of wish might give them an edge in this situation. Meanwhile back at the scene, Zenith, Katara, and Amarok are about to subjugate Omni Goku. Since the power hadn't matured yet and Goku himself hadn't regained his own consciousness, Zenith might be able to absorb it himself. What drives these warriors is still kind of shrouded in mystery, but by this point, it's obvious that it's more than just a mere thirst for this power. Just what exactly happened all those millions of years ago that led to these men embarking on such a path here? On the other side, Broly and Omni Goku are exchanging brutal blows like complete savages, all the while shrieking each other's names. They honestly look like they're having a pretty fun time over there, and Vegeta wonders if exchanging blows with the Saiyan whom Kakarot had instinctually known ever since he was born might snap some senses back into him, so he chooses not to disturb their duel, at least for now. 
So now at this grand stage, we have Broly and Goku who are duking it out on one hand, while Zenith and his fellow warriors are just kind of standing over there. They would have long since jumped in the battle between Broly and Goku if it weren't for Omega Vegeta standing in between both sides whilst giving off stupendous ominous vibes in every single direction ready for whatever. Guess I'll just take care of you lot before closing the matter with Kakarot. What do you say brother of the Omni King, Vegeta states while standing in their way as an insurmountable wall. While this goes on, off in a different sector of Universe 7, Frieza kind of reminisces about the good old days when he used to reign supreme over the universe as an emperor, and somewhere along the way, those monkeys just began to get in his way and he's been since chasing after them all this time. At this rate, I'll never be the emperor of the universe again, he sadly murmurs to himself. He's tried to mimic the Ultra Instinct, but he knows he can, it's not something that can simply be mimicked. In the end, even Platinum Frieza wasn't enough for him to regain his status as the one and only Emperor of this universe. I'll be damned if I go out like this, Frieza screams and then flies off to parts unknown. That doesn't really sound too good, but I'm sure we'll see how this plays out in the next part. Going back to the scene, it's an epic showdown between Zenith and Omega Vegeta. I still don't understand how you somehow managed to exist and not exist at the same time, says Vegeta while dodging several of Zenith's blows. Well, that's a secret. You are pretty strong, aren't you, Yamoshi's descendant? Now if only you were able to land blows on me, I'd, I'd be doomed, Zenith replies. You know, it's been bugging me how you keep mentioning Yamoshi. How do you know him? Even I, the Saiyan Prince, had never heard of this name until just a few years ago, says Vegeta. Ah, you are the curious one, aren't you? Zenith replies while landing a quick blow on Vegeta's gut. Well, stop screwing around and speak if you have something to say, Vegeta says, but he's still unable to land any solid blows on Zenith. In fact, no one has managed to deal him any damage ever since the clash between the Omni Kamehameha and the Omega Flash. Alright, I guess I can tell you. Now listen carefully, Yamoshi's descendant. What I'm about to tell you is a story from long ago. Back in the ancient times when the multiverse was in an era of constant warfare in the states. You don't make sense, didn't Yamoshi exist only a thousand years ago? How was he supposed to be present in ancient times, Vegeta says. I think you've confused Yamoshi with someone else. What I'm talking about is a warrior whose existence itself was an anomaly, Zenith says, and then he starts sharing the story of Yamoshi. It happened long before Zeno became an Omni King. I was a warrior going from universe to universe in search of strong opponents. Having reached the absolute peak of my potential, someone stronger aside, there were hardly anyone who could even pose to be a good sparring partner for me. Though this is when I would come across a weak warrior named Yamoshi. He had a distinct glare. Even now I can't forget those eyes. Of course, as one would expect, he challenged me to a duel, but it barely took a punch or two before he was rendered incapable of moving anymore. So I would tell him to train and come back again in a thousand years when he's finally strong enough to hold his own against someone like me. I see, so you had been associating me with a weakling, Vegeta intrudes, but Zenith continues on. No, not at all, at least listen to the entire story, he says. Even after suffering a humiliating defeat, the warrior known as Yamoshi didn't lose that glare. Without permission, he started following me on my travels. Whenever we came across a strong opponent, he'd be the first one to take them on. Of course, since Yamoshi didn't really stand a chance most of the time, he'd continually just kinda get his ass handed to him, but after a year and a half of him traveling with me, it was the 1000th time that he challenged me. He had grown beyond reason, and I had never seen a potential on this level before. It was absolutely inconceivable. And that's when it happened. In the middle of our duel, he lashed out because I was going a bit too easy on him, I guess. I take offense and knock him unconscious with two heavy blows. Though right when I was about to leave him be and go take a nap myself, Yamoshi suddenly gets up and lets out a loud, unwavering roar. And then magically, his hair starts to turn golden, and his strength simply implodes out of proportion. But he had gone berserk and was simply just destroying things left and right. I still remember to this day, despite becoming so strong, that I was having a hard time finding a strong opponent. I had an even harder time keeping Yamoshi in check. It took a lot of effort before he calmed down, though he fell unconscious once again. 
It was only later that he finally opened up and told me about how most of his people were killed because of infighting and sadly, it was an outside force that caused discourse within his race. Yamoshi wanted to return his proud warrior race to its former glory, however a great tragedy resulted in the absolute extermination of his entire race. Okay, this Yamoshi you talk about is definitely not a Saiyan because the Saiyan race is still alive and prosperous even in other universes Vegeta interrupts him. No, no, I watched it happen right in front of me, Zenith replies. The transformation Yamoshi pulled off was almost exactly the same as that Broly guy the Omni King is fighting against. This timeline doesn't match up at all though, Vegeta states. What you speak of is an era that was millions of years ago. Plus, how were the Saiyans still alive if they were exterminated along with their entire universe? That makes no sense. The Yamoshi we know of is just a myth from thousands of years ago, Vegeta says. I see, Zenith replies. So you aren't yet familiar with the way this multiverse works. Alright, for my old friend's sake, I'll explain what I think might have happened. Remember how there used to be 18 universes Zenith goes on? And 6 of them were completely erased out of existence, correct? Years would pass following that insane transformation of his and together we continued to travel across the galaxies and Yamoshi grew even stronger. At one point he surpassed even the gods of destruction by outlashing his godly key. I don't think Yamoshi ever got as strong as you guys here but seeing his growth was always a delight to me Zenith says. And during our 10,000th duel ever. I, Zenith, lost to Yamoshi for the very first time. This was when he parted ways for a while and returned back to his home planet. It wasn't anything to fuss about, I was just gonna win the next time we met. Unfortunately, fate didn't allow that to happen. An unpredictable turn of events resulted in the total annihilation of his universe as well as five others. It happened only moments before Yamoshi's child was supposed to be born. Everything about this warrior race erased on the spot. Only I and my companions still remember Yamoshi. So what exactly are you guys and who is this Yamoshi you speak of? Well, I have a hypothesis. The multiverse follows a cycle where an extinct race will eventually be reborn even if it happens millions of years later. So the Saiyan race would be reborn and coincidentally or maybe even by fate, another distinguished warrior named Yamoshi appeared on the scene. Who knows, Yamoshi was supposed to have a son after all, so maybe it was fate. I mean, that's why I keep calling y'all Yamoshi's descendants. It's to instill the notion that Yamoshi's race survived and prospered. Also, have I mentioned how you guys look almost exactly like Yamoshi's in the finishes? But you three have displayed a level of strength that even I'm not sure if I'd win against, if I were to use conventional methods, that is. Hearing this story, Vegeta experiences a momentary pause. He had no idea that his race's history was this deep. But the moment Zenith finishes his story, he orders both Amarok and Karara to gang up on Vegeta together with him. They rob the Saiyan Prince of his moment of silence and so Omega Vegeta simultaneously would land a punch on both Amarok and Karara with each of his fists. Feels nice to finally be able to hit someone, Vegeta expresses himself and pushes both of them back. He still had yet to even be able to hit Zenith once though. However, this momentary opening allows Zenith to pass straight through and reach Omni Goku. Omni Goku's maturity had come to a halt, or rather a breaking point, because of the mindless exchange between him and Broly. Zenith was going to use this opportunity to somehow acquire that power for himself, especially because the power is currently being sandwiched between the supernatural and Goku's own consciousness which would probably make it a little bit easier to take from him. But just when Zenith was about to lay hands on Ami Goku, a bright ball of light emerges right in front of them all. Vegeta, Whis, Zenith, Kamara, Amarag, Broly, they're all perplexed. It's still much too soon for the Grand Priest and Zeno to be here. And they would be right, because the duo that landed on Earth before them all is none other than Piccolo and Gohan. But it was still weird because they obviously sensed the presence of the Grand Priest and Zeno somehow. However, even after Gohan and Piccolo had arrived, that ball of light still didn't disappear. And that itself may spell an ominous conclusion for this saga because it was indeed the Grand Priest and Zeno. Piccolo and Gohan's teleportation just happened to coincide with their emergence as well. Zenith and his companions are dumbstruck. They've run out of time. 
they've been completely taken off guard because all things considered, it should have taken two entire days for Zeno and the Grand Priest to reach the scene. They're about a whole day and a half too early here. Well, well, if it isn't Zenith, the Grand Priest exclaims before setting his eyes towards Omni Goku next. Omni Goku would sense the Grand Priest's glare. He would instantly stop trading blows with Broly and simply glares back. As for Vegeta, well, he would immediately go to confront the Grand Priest face to face and states, leave. This universe is my responsibility. I will take care of everything. The Grand Priest simply replies, if you would like to avoid punishment at a later date, I would suggest that you back off. This situation is already far out of your control. Whis, who had been sidelined the entire battle, welcomes both the Zeno duo and his father. However, Vegeta refuses to back off. Omega Vegeta is the essence of his ultra ego taken to extreme heights. If he backs off now, he'll lose the very source of his strength. As if Vegeta's pride would allow for something like that to happen anyway. Amidst this conversation, somebody has lost their mind as a solid kick lands on the Grand Prix's shoulder, which hinders his footing slightly. It was from Omni Goku. Not only that, but it seems like Omni Goku has just lost it at this point as he then proceeds to land massive punches on the Zeno duo in offense of the highest tier in the multiverse, a cardinal sin to some, just blasphemous to others. He was about to land another one, but this is when Gohan would pop up right in front of his punch and tanks it to the fullest extent. This does catch Omni Goku off guard, but that's when Gohan would utter three words. Father, wake up. And that would be it. The boiling point has been breached. This was the final hinge Omni Goku needed before regaining his own consciousness. Just what the heck is going on here? Why are all you guys here? Says Goku after finally awakening from his deep slumber. But what might the consequences be now that both the Grand Priest and Zeno are here? As for what happens next, Piccolo and Gohan have suddenly appeared at the scene and in conjunction, the Grand Priest and the Zeno duo have appeared as well. Without giving the time for proper greetings, Omni Goku instinctively attacks their new guest. He's fortunately stopped by Gohan before they reach the point of no return though. And miraculously, Gohan's hefty little interference here somehow manages to wake up Goku who had long been lying dormant inside his own body. So what exactly happened here? What was going on with Goku's body? How was he cursed with this power in the first place? Well, to answer all of this, let's go back in time a little and see what has actually been happening all of this time. Goku has just ingested the raging Omni Key and formally became Omni Goku. Though inside Omni Goku's consciousness, he himself lies dormant, fundamentally incapable of having any influence over his body. It's a void. There's nothing. He can't see anything. He can't hear anything. He has no idea what's been going on outside all this time. This polarity was created because the power of the Omni King which now resides in him was never supposed to be compatible with his body in the first place. The one who was supposed to take the throne as the new Omni King was in fact Majin Buu and for that reason the power was supposedly compatible with his life energy, not Goku's. But it wasn't that simple though. Both Oob and Good Buu shared similar life force compositions and since the traces of this life force were present in more than one body. The Omni Key itself was intended to be flexible. And yet, when it emerged, the two contemporaries were already engaging in an insanely heated duel. The Omni Key was forcibly triggered, which resulted in an exhibiting violence. This sudden collage ended with Oob's body becoming the vassal for the Omni Key, but that's when someone foiled the plans of the entire multiverse. As we know, that happened to be Goku. He was actually able to absorb the raging key and subsequently ended up in a state of endless trance. Zenith was wrong. The power wasn't maturing in Goku's body. No, in fact, it was never meant to be compatible with him. It was simply running amok while borrowing Goku's body. However, for the Omni Key that still hasn't matured yet, it wasn't able to overcome the instinctual nature of Goku's body and so couldn't help but seek out battles with Vegeta, Zenith, Broly, and now the Grand Priest. If things were to continue this way, Goku was never going to regain consciousness. He was forever going to be stuck in that state of endless slumber without any thoughts, will, or existence whatsoever. But what brought him out of that state? No, it wasn't Gohan. It wasn't Broly either. 
Rather, it was something Omega Vegeta did without even realizing. In his desperate attempt to somehow rival the Omni Key, Vegeta attained a peculiar ability. The power to bypass dimensions. Of course, Vegeta still had no idea how this ability worked, but despite that, he managed to do something that shouldn't have been possible and created a breach in the void that Goku was currently lying dormant in. But it still wasn't enough. It's all for naught unless Goku himself manages to find the way out. That breach was simply a gateway. Broly, however, did well in alarming Goku's state of existence, and the breach provided enough leeway for Goku to realize that he does in fact still exist. But finding the small breach in an endlessly dark realm with lingering life energy was like walking a million miles with no direction. It was unreasonable, simply impossible to expect Goku to somehow make it out of this void. This was now his fate, his curse for impeding the whim of the multiverse. Broly's screams served as his only direction, but they were way too inconsistent for Goku's fleeting consciousness to pinpoint a singular direction. However, Gohan's words would resolve that. They served as the compass, the map even, and Goku managed to sense the right direction. And just like that, he knew the specific direction he needed to walk towards in this darkness. But the flow of time was different here. Each minute that passed in this void was akin to several thousand lifetimes in the known Universe 7. Goku would simply walk. Before long, 100 years had passed and yet he had only covered a fraction of the entire distance. Strangely enough, his fleeting consciousness turned out to be the boon in this situation. It's because he didn't have enough mental capacity that his lingering existence could focus on the singular way forward. Just like that, he kept moving forward. After a good 10,000 years of walking, Goku could finally see that breach. It was here that his lingering existence finally started regaining his consciousness. Even though it was the final push, just one more sprint. In this instance, his consciousness became aware once again. Goku was hit with an insurmountable level of psychological pain. Despite feeling anything, he had to keep moving forward, and now his mental state was going to pay that price. Unfortunately, Goku tries to scream, but he just didn't have the energy. The psychological pain became unbearable, and so, in an attempt to relieve him of the suffering, his body tries to relieve his soul of this turmoil. This was only a natural occurrence, however, as Goku had already exhausted the last of his life's fumes about a thousand years ago. His consciousness just didn't realize it at the time. Obviously, the man himself wasn't unaware of how his soul was literally trying to leave his body. He also knew how dire those consequences would be. If he were to pass away in this void, Goku's soul would continue to wander around here for all eternity. The only way to escape this is for his life force to go back through the breach. And yet, there was nothing he could do. He tries to scream but fails. He tries to walk but cripples himself. He tries to see, but the light before him begins to fade away. And it was at this very moment that Goku truly understood what it meant to be alone in the realm of Void. Or so he thought. In truth, there was one individual. Goku's endless march had caught his attention. For the longest time, this man had also been in a deep slumber until a wandering Omni Key somehow stumbled upon his place and even ended up erasing his favorite pajamas. Of course, this also served as the disruption that woke him up from the slumber. Wait, how did somebody sneak this deep into this realm? I was having a peaceful sleep back here, the enigmatic man explains. He was more so along the lines of being confused rather than being annoyed because it should be somewhat outside of the realm of possibilities for anyone to just casually stumble upon his threshold. Anyways, this man tried to look into the disruption and somehow noticed Goku struggling in a void. This interested him, and so he kept watching. Seeing Goku just continue his march, but then breaking apart after finally regaining enough consciousness was enough to move this man. It was inspiring at first, but tragic from there on out. Goku can't really move any longer. He still hasn't given up though, because if he does, his soul itself will be lost here forever. And so, the man continues to latch onto his soul. That's all he could really manage to keep his existence from completely fading away. This was when this enigmatic man decided to appear before Goku. 
Young man, what do you wish for? Speak your mind, I'll grant any wish you desire, he says to Goku. And little did Goku know that after going through such diabolical levels of psychological exhaustion, just feeling someone else's presence was going to feel so warm to him. He has no recollection of what he actually asked, but the enigmatic man responded to his request and prepared a gigantic table full of all sorts of different meals with meat of the highest order. Y'all know how Goku gets down. If anyone else were to see this sight, they, they would probably laugh, but this is Goku. In the middle of such endless darkness, there would be a singular table full of all sorts of meals and just a tiny speck of light making its existence apparent. Goku's body that had long since given up finally shifted its attention towards something else. All that food. This allowed him to muster enough strength to get up and sit on that table. From there on out, it was just an ape devouring everything there was. While ordinarily Goku might have laughed and smiled while eating such a high tier feast, here he couldn't help but let out pure tears and emotions. The enigmatic man had already left and over the next few years, Goku just continued eating. But this was yet another psychological trap of the void. Unless or until he becomes satisfied with filling his belly, the food on the table will never end. But Goku knew that, and he was subsequently visualizing his energy being restored, and after the seventh continuous year of consistently eating, he realizes that he's had enough. The food on the table also finally disappears. Ah, that was delicious. Eh, it still wasn't as good as Chi Chi's cooking though, says Goku. And after making such a recovery, Goku continues sprinting towards that tiny speck of light. Meanwhile, in the outside reality, not even a minute has passed yet. While for Goku, it's been over 12,000 years since he's heard Gohan's voice. Time hardly mattered anyway. He knew that the moment he's out, all of this pain he had to go through will become insignificant. And just like that, as he continued sprinting, Goku finally bypassed the breach and regained control over his body. His first words after getting out and seeing all these folks in front of him were, just what the heck is going on here? Ha, so you're finally back, Kakarot. The first one to comment was, of course, Vegeta. Dad, something crucial has happened to you. I'm afraid if we don't handle this carefully, the Grand Priest and the Omni King might turn out to be our enemies this time, Gohan tries to explain to him. But Goku silently pats Gohan's shoulder and says, Don't worry, son. I won't be defeated ever again. Following this, Goku witnesses the stern look on Vegeta's face. He knew something had to be done. They had already reached the point of no return. So I take it you finally matured as the new Omni King, Goku, says the Grand Priest. You call that maturing, Goku silently replies. Indeed, none were aware of what had actually happened to Goku. Everyone simply thought that he had been chosen as the new Omni King now. But that wasn't the case. And because it wasn't, Goku had to go through diabolical, downright inconceivable levels of suffering. All of this prompted Goku to make one big statement. I've been meaning to try and fight you for a while now. Oh, Grand Priest. Looks like here's my cue. Oh, are you sure about this? If we can resolve this peacefully, I could even end up serving you, you know, says the Grand Priest. His words were indeed sincere because, by accident or not, Goku was the new Omni King and the one who was supposed to take the reins now. Shut up, I'm not your puppet, says Goku while getting into his fighting stance. That's right, he was fully intent on fighting the Grand Priest here. Perhaps this was the only way for him to let out some steam now. He had also already noticed how there were some other insanely strong individuals here as well. Then, there's Vegeta's heightened state like none other. He had a lot of fighting to look forward to. Meanwhile, Zenith and the others were remaining on standby. What should we do now, boss? Amarok asks. Let's just watch for now, Zenith replies. I don't know how. This Grand Priest just got here so fast. Vegeta was honestly already bearing some ill will for the way the Grand Priest interrupted, so he was wondering if he should interfere or not. Piccolo and Gohan also couldn't do anything but watch as Goku dashed straight in front of the Grand Priest and landed a massive blow. It wasn't the blow itself that was massive, though. Rather, the weight in the afterimage. The Grand Priest, on the other hand, nonchalantly stops it with his arm. Except, 
he didn't. Despite completely stopping the blow, the impact recoil blew him away. What? Says the Grand Priest. After what Goku had just gone through, anyone else might have found themselves eternally traumatized. But this man used that experience to muster up an even greater level of strength. He had just landed a solid blow on the Grand Priest. Goku lets out an immediate laugh and then once again looks at the Grand Priest straight in the eye. Well then, time to get serious. In fact, that went for both of them. The Grand Priest was indeed quite strong. He had been serving by the side of the Omni Kings ever since the first one and had grown meticulously strong over all of those eras. And yet, Goku's blow still managed to have an effect on him. When the Grand Priest arrived here with the Zeno duo, he was planning on resolving this without much conflict. However, Goku's unwavering desire to seek out a duel was something he couldn't ignore. They had to solve this matter with fists, which isn't too out of the ordinary for Dragon Ball. Goku dives right into the space between them and prepares to land a low kick. The Grand Priest takes a counter stance, readying himself for Goku, but as the both of them were about to exchange the first blows, Vegeta suddenly pops up in front of Goku. Hold it, Kakarot. The fate of the universe lies on this, and I won't let you half-ass something else again, he says. I know, Vegeta. Trust me. For now, though, just back off. Unless we don't defeat him first, we won't get anywhere, Goku replies. Then I'll be the one to do it, Vegeta states. No, leave this one to me, Goku replies. You keep an eye on those two. Make sure they don't go around erasing stuff. Now, normally Vegeta would have scorned thrice before taking any order from Goku, but seeing the depth of Goku's glare, he decided to see how things unfold for a while. Hey, don't worry, Vegeta, the god of destruction. I'll be sure to make time for you after I destroy this anomaly, the Grand Priest says, making his intentions crystal clear now. But right when he finished this statement, Goku was already behind him, and just when he noticed, he was already experiencing the sheer weight of Goku's blow. The Grand Priest felt hindered for an instance, but followed Goku's blow with an equally overwhelming punch of his own. This battle was so intense that the spectators were left speechless. However, both Vegeta and Zenith were carefully analyzing where these two warriors stood relative to themselves. As for what happens next, the Zeno duo is beyond captivated by the action between Goku and the Grand Priest. It's not really every day that you get to see the Grand Priest of all people fight. While Zenith, who was initially quite perplexed at the sight of two Zenos, finally rationalizes why the power of the Omni King decided to emerge now of all times. Ah, so the multiverse really can't tolerate more than one person in the same position, he goes on. Even though my little brother has finally found himself a playmate. Here we are, Zenith expresses himself to Amarok and Karara. I was wondering the same, but what do you think would happen when the power fully matures in this new Omni King, Amarok says? Will they be deactivated? What has the Grand Priest been planning to do about the situation, I wonder? Honestly, I have no idea, Zenith replies. It just really sucks when your own little brother is the Omni King. <laughs> You got that right. I wonder what my brother's been up to, Karara says. Been forever since I last saw him. It's a complicated turn of events, but I highly doubt he'd choose to show up now of all times, Zenith says. There's nothing that guy loves more than sleep. Though, from the looks of it, the Grand Priest really didn't even flinch at the sight of us, did he? It had been well over 20 minutes since the battle between Omni Goku and the Grand Priest started, and Goku was lucky enough to land a couple of blows. However, ever since then, he hasn't even been able to touch the Grand Priest let alone try to attack him. Zenith and the others knew full well of the Grand Priest's ability, so they were hardly surprised. Meanwhile, Vegeta was astounded beyond words. What is this, Kakarot? Even after mastering the Ultra Instinct and then becoming this strong, you're still unable to match his movements? Come on, get a grip. Broly was in the same boat, however. The beauty of the Grand Priest's movements somehow bestowed calm and tranquility upon his rampaging warrior spirit. He was in a zone of his own now. Whis, on the other hand, is still simply a spectator. He isn't even fulfilling his usual role as a narrator now. However, the ones who were the most dismayed were Gohan and Piccolo, the only two people at this point in time who actually know what happened to Goku thanks to the Dragon Balls. This is no good, Piccolo comments. Unless Goku defeats this guy, we're all pretty much finished. Our history 
pride, hopes, everything about us is gonna get erased from existence. I'm afraid we'll have to be ready to jump in and stop dad at any moment, even though this is no longer a situation we can just talk out of, Gohan says. Both of them have become irrationally dismayed. Vegeta, however, was positioned close by and couldn't help but notice the excruciatingly pale looks on their faces. What's the matter with you, Gohan, Vegeta says. I've seen you being pathetic before, but never in my decades of living experience as a warrior have I seen a face this pale. Live in fear as you may, I've already made up my mind. Even if it's the Grand Priest, I'll defeat him today. Defeating exponentially more powerful opponents is how a Saiyan evolves into something even stronger. So cower as you might, but stay out of my way. Vegeta, you don't understand, Gohan states in a light yet flinching tone. This man right in front of us is the mediator of the multiverse and the only living entity to be able to harness the tangibility of the multiverse itself. That's not something you can defeat with reason or power. That's not something you can defeat even if you were a thousand times stronger than you are right now. It's theoretically impossible. Naturally, Vegeta was taken aback as well, and even Whis had never mentioned anything about a power this astronomical. Wait, am I missing something here? Vegeta firmly asked Gohan. How did you guys get here, and why do you know this in the first place? Spit it out, Gohan. Everything you know. And this is where we cut back to what happened at New Namek after Piccolo and Gohan get their first wish granted. They had already asked Perunga to translate and then also narrate the chapter on the Omni King in the Old Testament of the Namekian Book of Legends. Perunga explained how whenever a new Omni King is born, the multiverse experiences a period of great change and enters a new age. Both Piccolo and Gohan pretty much already knew that Goku is the new Omni King in this case, but this rationale came with a lingering question. Why was it Goku? No matter how you choose to look at it, Goku just isn't the type of person who'd fit this role, Piccolo says, but then instantly came to a standstill. He had only just realized something extraordinarily crucial. That's right, the fact that the power didn't emerge from within Goku in the first place. Perunga was still awaiting the second wish, so Piccolo chooses to simply confirm his doubts and ask this. What the heck is happening to Goku, Piccolo asked Perunga. Just who is he right now? Very well then, I shall answer your question, Perunga replies. This might sound counterintuitive, but know that while the power of the Omni King does reside within Goku, he himself is neither a vassal nor the inheritor. I can only speak of what I conceive. Goku right now is cursed by the chaos of the Omni Key, destined to walk in an endlessly dark void for an infinite period of time. He himself is unaware of what's going on. A lock has been placed on his own soul and will. In simpler words, Goku is no longer an inhabitant of this multiverse. In exchange for forcibly having to use his body, the Omni Key banished his consciousness from this multiverse. Hearing this came across as an absolute shock to both Gohan and Piccolo. It was like despair on steroids at this point. No way, you mean we'll never see him again? Gohan hesitantly asked. Can we even use the Dragon Balls to bring his consciousness back? I'm afraid us dragons lack the ability to manipulate or negate Omni Key, Perunga goes on. You can go ask Super Shinron for the same thing. He may be able to help. But as things stand, I don't think that'll be necessary. Wait, what do you mean, Piccolo asks? I'm not sure how it happened or just why, Perunga continues, but someone was able to use one of the four forbidden celestial techniques, reversed string entanglement. Long before the age of the 12 universes or even the 18 universes, there were strong individuals who learned to harness dark matter and created various celestial techniques. One of these techniques allowed one to manipulate the string nature of the universe and create pathways to the higher dimensions or possibly even beyond that. Naturally, these celestial techniques were far too powerful. A great many tragedies occurred because of them. In the end, the Omni King of that time consulted the matter with the Grand Priest and all of the users of these forbidden arts were either erased out of existence or simply deactivated. Since then, whenever an individual accidentally stumbles onto one of these techniques, they're simply erased out of existence and it's been that way for countless ages. Or so it says in the Old Testament of the Namekian Book of Legends. It is a history book after all, Perunga finishes. Hearing this, the Namekians were dumbfounded. Despite being very well versed in history, they had no idea about this knowledge. Wait, you mean this technique is what'll get my father out of that endless void, Gohan asked once again? Now, now, calm down, Saiyan boy, Perunga 
says. I was getting to that part. The user of said technique has been using it unknowingly so far. We're talking about that new god of destruction here, Paranga goes on. He's in big trouble. The moment the Grand Priest finds out that this technique was used, it's not just him that'll be getting erased. I wonder if I should be saying my goodbyes now. Well, anyways, this individual instinctively created a breach in that endless void. However, Goku's consciousness isn't vital enough to sense the direction of that void. Someone must become his guide. I'm sure, even with his lingering consciousness, that man's instincts are desperately trying to understand the direction of that breach. Still though, I'm not sure if calling out to him is a good idea. The Grand Priest is the mediator of the multiverse. He won't let it slide. But then again, letting the Omni Key out on its own might not be an even worse idea. I'm just saying, Purunga finishes. Purunga knew how dire the situation was, and so he was using his kind of terrible humor to at least light up the conversation, but it really was not working. Be it the Namekians or Gohan and Piccolo, the anxiety made everyone seem to age several years in the past few moments. Gohan, this may very well be the end of everything. Let's at least go and get Goku out of that void, Piccolo suggests. Of course, that was the plan, Gohan continues. Paranga, for the final wish, just instant transmission us all the way there if you could. So this would conclude how Gohan and Piccolo were able to arrive on the scene, and now that Gohan has relayed the entire story to Vegeta, one thing instantly comes to his mind. It's me. I'm the one who used that forbidden technique. But how, Vegeta thinks to himself? Is it related to my Omega state? Anyways, reverse string entanglement. Well, Bulma would love to see that. As expected, Vegeta's head was thrown into a weird loop. He also finally realizes that hidden implication when Weast asked him in a previous video where he was sending those erase bombs. No wonder Whis has been kind of distant from Goku and Vegeta since that happened because the Grand Priest is definitely not gonna like that either. Meanwhile, the Grand Priest continues to engage in action with Goku which slightly resembles a battle now. I don't understand, what's this guy's deal, Goku says to himself. After staying in that void for so long, all of my senses should naturally be even sharper. The current state of my Ultra Instinct should be able to go toe to toe with him. Just what's happening? Goku's head was also in a loop. Listen Goku, the Grand Priest expresses, you've been chosen by the multiverse as the new ruler of the 12 universes. There's no reason for us to fight. I'm supposed to be your aide, not your enemy. I don't get why everyone is so quick to label me as a villain. I'm just a mediator, you know, the Grand Priest says innocently. However, Goku himself was aware that even if he gives in to what the Grand Priest is saying, it's only a matter of time before the truth is discovered. Feigning ignorance won't help if that were to happen. And yet, this is when Vegeta chooses to stop being a spectator and finally intervenes in their battle. Despite knowing what would happen if the Grand Priest realized how he used one of those four forbidden techniques, he comes forth and spills the beans. Hey look, since earlier I've been able to create these smooth breaches in space. Do you perhaps have any idea what this is about, Sir Grand Priest? Vegeta says this in the most patronizing manner possible while actually using that technique almost as if he had already resolved himself to be the scapegoat for whatever punishment awaited their universe. It seemed like he just wanted everyone else, including Goku, to survive. Still though, he wasn't planning on going down without a fight. As for the Grand Priest, the mere sight of that taboo technique was enough to completely sway his attention. Within a few instances, great roars and tremors can be heard throughout the universe. Now you've done it. Let me do the honor of personally destroying you and this universe, the Grand Priest states, in a genuinely calm manner while also closing his eyes. However, the space outside starts to shift. The black matter defies physics and starts to melt, while a glistening white aura appears to envelope the Grand Priest. He was simply standing right in front of them, and yet his after image appeared to be as magnanimous as the entire space before them. It was indeed as if this individual was harnessing the very vitality of space and time around them. I'll show you all why I'm the mediator of this multiverse, the Grand Priest states, as it seems the final battle between the Grand Priest and everyone else is set to commence. But what of Frieza? What of Broly? And what of these Universe 12 warriors that are still mysteriously spectating in the background, waiting to make their move? At this current moment, after the Grand Priest released his power, everyone is taken aback. The Grand Priest is quite literally manipulating the space-time continuum around them, so this is what Gohan meant when he said that the Grand Priest can harness the tangibility of the multiverse. Gohan and Piccolo were obviously frustrated at how Vegeta just spilled the beans like that, but more than that, they were terrified of what may happen next. Destroyer Vegeta, I apologize in advance. 
You might not have any ill intentions for using this technique, but I'm afraid I'll have to erase you and this universe right away. It's all for the sake of maintaining the balance of everything, the Grand Priest firmly states. Hey, hey, can I do it? The future Zeno asks. No, wait, this is Goku's universe. We shouldn't be erasing it, the other Zeno replies. You need not concern yourself with this, Zeno-sama, for I'll be the one who will destroy this universe and pave the way for a new era, the Grand Priest states. The Grand Priest was overflowing with life force and his aura was only continuing to expand. Hey Kakarot, I don't think you can defeat this man, Vegeta says. I know, you seriously didn't have to provoke him even further either, Goku replies. Hey, it's still better than him realizing you're an imposter, Vegeta says. Listen, Vegeta. This might be the first time ever that we're confronting an opponent that we may never be able to defeat, but whatever man, it's like I haven't fought anyone in more than 10,000 years. This adrenaline just doesn't stop, Goku replies. Hearing this, Vegeta seemed that he could be more glad that Goku had completely woken up now. He unleashes his Omega state and dashes straight in, only this time, he was aware of the essence of this technique and was planning on using it in coherence with his other moves. Splendid warrior, what a man you are, Vegeta, the Grand Priest says. Despite realizing who you're up against, your eyes still haven't lost their flair. This might be the end for you, but you have my respect. Not good. Seems like Vegeta is sacrificing himself to sway the Grand Priest's attention away from Father Gohan comments. Oh, at least he isn't going down without a fight, Piccolo replies. Vegeta was propelling himself at an incomprehensible speed. It might seem like he had given up, and it was nothing but a suicide assault, but Vegeta was fully intent on taking down the Grand Priest here. Goku instantly recognized his intentions and started positioning himself accordingly. Let's do this, Vegeta, he says. As long as we can make him concede defeat, there is a tomorrow. Unfortunately, as fast and as hard as Vegeta was propelling himself, he was still very much not outside of the realm of space and time. The instant Vegeta was close enough to land a blow and Goku had quite conveniently positioned himself behind the Grand Priest, everything came to a halt. Right then, in that very moment, everything was the Grand Priest's domain. There was a massive impact that resulted in the sweeping away of all of the nearby planets and stars, all because the Grand Priest had just punched an invisible hole through Vegeta's stomach. It was way too fast. Goku couldn't use Vegeta as bait to land one himself, and Vegeta couldn't lure in the Grand Priest. Everyone was flabbergasted around him. Gradually, we see Vegeta's eyes lose their light. Reality in front of him appears to be fading away, and yet the Grand Priest wasn't done. He makes sure to bestow upon him yet another powerful blow of the same tier. Vegeta was about to be instantly decimated at this point, and just like Gohan had said previously, even if he was a thousand times stronger than he is now, he still wouldn't be able to match up to the Grand Priest, let alone defeat him. It is indeed theoretically impossible. Vegeta was already long unconscious, he might as well be dead if it weren't for the destroyer key he was given, and yet the Grand Priest still didn't let up. He was preparing for yet another attack. That's when two individuals react instinctively. Broly launches his strongest Omega Blaster yet. It starts off as a tiny lime green energy sphere, sneaks up on the Grand Priest and immediately becomes the size of a black hole. Naturally, even something like this was of no concern to the Grand Priest. He simply waves his hand to distort the reality around him in order to melt and sweep away that blaster. But the tiny fraction of a second which was used to evade Broly's attack allowed Goku to slide in and rescue Vegeta. He then uses the instant transmission to get away. It's strange. If Father wanted, he could have easily decimated all three of them. Looks like even someone like him was craving for some good action, Whis says while joining Gohan and Piccolo. Say, Whis, if this universe was erased, you'd be deactivated as well, right? How can you be so calm in a moment like this, Gohan asks. Not at all, in fact, Whis replies. Deactivation would relieve me of my current duties. Plus, isn't death just the beginning of a new life? Goku and Broly have already gotten away and are maintaining a safe distance now. As Goku asked Vegeta, don't tell me you're already cooked. Of course, there was no reply from the unconscious Vegeta for more than 30 seconds, but then he subtly opens his eyes. There was something that everyone but the Grand Priest missed. Though the impact was astronomical, Vegeta successfully managed to use his reverse string technique to create a leeway for a hefty amount of that friction. 
This was how he survived two continuous blows from the Grand Priest. Listen, Kakarot. If you were to train and get stronger for a thousand or even a million years, you think you'll ever be able to defeat him, Vegeta asks? Ordinarily, no. This guy has plasma on his side, but I'm sure I can eventually defeat him when it comes to raw power, Goku replies. Alright, I have a proposition then. Let's do the fusion dance, Vegeta firmly states. His eyes might have lost a bit of light, but he still had that flair. Can you even stand up, let alone do the dance, Goku asks. Don't worry about that, I still have the Batari earrings I was supposed to give to the new Supreme Kai, Vegeta replies. Wait, are you sure about this? You have the Destroyer Key and I have the Chaotic Omni Key. Forget being able to revert back to ourselves, we might not even retain consciousness, Goku says. The Grand Priest knew they were planning something, but still chose to not interfere. But he was indeed going to personally destroy everything about Universe 7 and merge its residue with the rest of the universes. An unconventional way of considering how the previous universes were literally erased by Zeno, but this is what he was planning to do. Broly, listen. This is our last attempt. There will be no other chances, but I want you to stay out of this. Even if we were to somehow manage to make the Grand Priest take back his decision, it's impossible for him to let us live considering what our powers imply now. In that case, I entrust you with the pride of the Saiyan race, Vegeta says, pausing for a second, and then he continues. I implore you, train Gohan and Kakarot's other son. Trunks too. Bola is a little too young for this, but she'll eventually pull through. Be fair to your Saiyan brethren in Universe 6, and don't forget to get yourself a son as well. Your genes are too valuable, Broly. As long as you guys live on, the Saiyan race will strive and prosper. Broly just kind of stood there listening to Vegeta silently. Goku as well knew that this was indeed their final battle. This was different from death though. There was no telling what would happen if they were to be deactivated or erased. What's going to happen to their souls? But that's not what the two of them were thinking about right now. Their minds were in a state of endless flow. This was a fight to ensure the survival of their universe once again. Goku pats Broly on the back and says, I can't think of anyone better to leave everything to. He then looks at Gohan from afar, their eyes matching and says, and you too as well, my son. Goku's words could definitely not be heard by Gohan, but even so, Gohan knew what they implied. He lifts his hand and pulls out a big thumbs up. Gohan lets out a smile of reassurance. Let's do this, Vegeta. I'm glad I'll go out fighting the strongest opponent there is, Goku says. I share that same sentiment, Kakarot, but even if it is up against the strongest, I still want to win, Vegeta says, while forcibly pumping out all of his destroyer key in coherence with his Omega state. Goku is conflicted about using his Omni key as it's still a separate entity inside of his body. In fact, this might as well be a fusion with three different life forms right now that they're trying. He tries to harness it for himself, but it always starts conflicting with his identity. Goku knows how risky it is to pull off a Patara fusion considering his current state, but they'll have to make do anyway. Meanwhile, Zenith and his companions were somewhat conflicted as well. Their entire plan revolved around crowning Zenith as the new Omni King, or at least making the new Omni King one of them. Despite the millions of years they've been around, they still had no idea that the Omni Key can't be stolen. It's something the multiverse itself must grant you with. Their entire approach was wrong. Well, Zenith, what should we do next? At this rate, this will be a repeat of what happened all those millions of years ago, Amarok says. It's beyond our control for now, Amarok, but this is far too interesting for me to just bail. Let's stick around and watch for a little bit, Zenith replies. Gohan and Piccolo also resolve to see this through to the end. For better or worse, this will be the last time they'll see Goku and Vegeta fight. Broly's killer instinct subsides and he composes himself. Even in this fight, he had grown so much. Looks like Goku and Vegeta will be using the fusion as their last resort, Whis comments. I think the same. Fusion has always been our trump card after all, Piccolo states. Hey, come on, why did you guys stop fighting all of a sudden? We're bored, the Zeno duo expresses. They were starving for more good entertainment. Vegeta was finally done harnessing all of his keep. He hands Goku one of the Patara, looks in the direction of the earth one last time and puts it on. Goku does the same. And just like that, a bright ray of light explodes. It can even be seen back on earth. It wasn't comforting at all though, rather it 
brought some strange sense of uneasiness. Meanwhile, a certain someone was observing everything from a different realm. Whoa, did they really just do that? When was the last time I felt this excited while just watching a fight, this enigmatic individual states? As for when that light dissipates, a single presence is seen standing right in front of the Grand Priest. This presence was the epitome of chaos itself. Well, well, we feel so strong right now we can hardly stay conscious. It's too chaotic. Something like this should only be able to exist in a myth. Omni Goku and Omega Vegeta all wrapped into one. What should we call this form then? I think I've got it. With this power, I feel 100% omnipotent anyway, so how about Omni Vegito? Yes, that sounds alright to us. Doesn't that just have a ring to it, old man? Vegito says, talking to the Grand Priest. As the final battle between Omni Vegito and the Grand Priest is about to start, a bad vibe starts swirling around the universe. Be it those who are seeing this battle firsthand, those in faraway galaxies who are unaware of this ordeal and yet can't help but feel uncomfortable, or even the ones back on Earth. Everyone can hardly hold their breath. Without even realizing it, they can feel the end is near. Celestial Vegito, huh? It's amazing how you Saiyans can become so strong so quickly. Consider me impressed, the Grand Priest states. I know, right? With this strength, we plan on sending you back, oh Grand Priest. There's no reason for Universe 7 to bear the punishment. This is between you and us. Let's do this. A mythical fight that will be talked about for ages to come, Vegito replies. Hearing this, the Grand Priest simply lets out a light laugh. It seems you're misunderstanding our current situation, Vegito-san. I am merely the mediator, and currently Universe 7 is an anomaly. Unless it is destroyed, I am afraid the multiverse will collapse. I'll give you seven minutes, but then it's the end, the Grand Priest says. His face was brimming with firmness. Well then, you give us no choice but to actually defeat you right here and now. Let Celestial Vegito be the progenitor of this new era. Old men should be enjoying their coffee, not destroying universes, Vegito sternly replies. Inside him, both Goku and Vegeta's consciousness were focused on a singular task, to make the Grand Priest concede defeat. Fooling around would have been absolute annihilation of their universe. Vegito instinctively makes the decision to dash towards the Grand Priest, but the instant he begins his sprint, the Grand Priest is no longer there. He was already behind them, grabbing their left arm and casually breaking the elbow. Once again, no one could follow the Grand Priest's movements. He was manipulating reality. Now, Vegito, what will you do? I've destroyed your elbow. If you choose to break away, you'll lose your left arm. But staying in this position would mean I can keep destroying all of your bones. The Saiyan race cannot overcome their physical disposition. Or can they? The Grand Priest states. But Vegito was already planning on losing a limb or two just so he can make contact with the Grand Priest. Otherwise, forget defeating him. The fight may end without them even touching the Grand Priest now that he's serious. Vegito turns around, effectively swirling his elbow and grabs the Grand Priest's wrist. Hey, hey, looks like I finally got you in my grasp now, Vegito says. Hey now, don't try anything corny like self-destruction or whatever. I still need Goku-san if he is to be crowned as the new Omni King, the Grand Prix states. Nah, I'm not Vegeta. I'm Vegito. So take this, Vegito says while unleashing an epic barrage of Banshee Blast with his right hand. He follows this up with a newly unlocked attack. One that involves the chaotic Omni Key together with Vegeta's celestial technique. Vegito had begun concentrating for this attack the moment his left arm was grabbed by the Grand Priest. Ordinarily, it's indeed impossible to defeat the Grand Priest, but what if they were able to somehow seal his consciousness somewhere else? Maybe in one of those different dimensions or realms? The destination didn't matter. Celestial Vegito's current strength would dwarf Omni Goku's strength by a terrifying margin, and yet, even so, Vegito knew that this is their last chance. One final shot to get out of this situation with their universe still intact. They'll deal with Zeno later. For now, the Grand Priest's outburst must be quelled. If he's this aggressive now, imagine what would happen when he realizes that Goku meddled with the Omni ritual. It was perfect in theory. The Grand Priest's surroundings will be erased because of the Omni Key. He won't be able to manipulate his way out. And then, the core of the attack, which is Vegeta's technique, will try to envelop his consciousness. 
They had this idea because of their fight with Zenith. In hindsight, it all makes sense. Zenith is impossible to touch because his body is either sealed or currently lying dormant in a different realm altogether. But there was one instance where Goku and Vegeta were able to hurt Zenith. It was the final collage of Final Flash imbued with Vegeta's technique together with Goku's Kamehameha. Vegeta's technique provided the leeway and then Goku's Kamehameha hurt Zenith. So now if there's something that would work, it's definitely this. And so, with the Grand Priest's wrist in his hand and an already broken elbow, Celestial Vegito releases an attack dubbed Celestial Chaos. It instantly erases everything around the Grand Priest and in that brief instance of time, the Grand Priest had nothing that he could manipulate. He literally had nothing around him. Well then, with this, I'm gonna have to say goodbye for now. Hopefully you'll reconsider your decision before you're back, Vegito states, as the final thrust of that new technique enveloped the Grand Priest entirely. However, in the face of this technique, which utilized the pinnacle of what Goku and Vegito were currently capable of, the Grand Priest grins and bestows an astronomical blow in Vegito's gut. You are much too naive. Isolating me and then banishing my consciousness to another realm? You do realize that the attack you just used is also something that can be manipulated, correct? The Grand Priest continues. Also, Goku. What is this? Now that I've seen this Omni Key, I can't help but notice the crudeness. It's unstable. This may be just a hunch, but by any chance, you didn't meddle with the ritual, did you? Celestial Vegeta was taken aback. With this one question, the Grand Priest was giving off an indomitable level of dominance. He demanded an answer, and he was gonna get it. I'm sorry, Father, but that's correct, we states. Apparently, the Omni Key emerged within Oob and Boo at the same time. This already made no sense, but then seeing its impact on those two, Goku chose to intervene and do something about that power. And so he took in that key within himself. I see, the Grand Priest says. This is indeed unusual. Well, I knew something like this would happen sooner or later since the future Zeno became a part of this timeline. There can only be one Omni King, the Grand Priest replies, and then he continues to say, I'm afraid I no longer need to hold back anymore. It's not just Vegeta. Goku shall be destroyed as well. These two have halted the progression of the multiverse. I'll eliminate them, this universe, and then I'll do something about the fact that two Zenosamas exist at the same time. I apologize, Whis, but this is the end for your universe. I understand, Father, Whis silently replies. Meanwhile, another powerful blow sends Vegito straight into a star that's over a thousand times bigger than the sun itself. Vegito absorbs the star and quite literally lights himself on fire, but with the amount of power and the type of power that he's outputting, he's kind of just a conductor right now. He dashes straight towards the Grand Priest at incomprehensible speeds, all the while preparing for a devastating kick, but once again, it was futile. The Grand Priest uses but a finger to block that kick, and then he bestows a celestial blow himself that destroys Vegito inside and out. From start to finish, the fight against the Grand Priest lasted 7 minutes total. Celestial Vegito lost. It was never even a challenge. And since Goku's Omni Key was never his to begin with and he couldn't maintain full control over it, the Patara Fusion failed as well. Then it's just Goku and Vegeta seconds away from losing everything. They can barely even open their eyes at this point. That's when the Grand Priest begins a full-scale disarrangement of Universe 7. All the galaxies, the stars, even Earth, they all start being compressed. The idea was to bring this universe back to its singularity and then spread that energy to the other universes. Hey Kakarot, get up. We're going for another round, Vegeta struggles to say. His consciousness was fading away, but he still hadn't given up. Goku, however, had exhausted all of his life force because of that rampant Omni Key within him. He could no longer even retain consciousness. Broly goes full berserk mode at this point and trying to stop the Grand Priest in an outright rampage over watching what happened to Goku and Vegeta, but of course, gets pummeled instantly. Gohan's eyes have turned completely white at this point as he too realizes that this is the end. Just once, he wishes to see Videl and Pan just one more time. Piccolo had accepted this destiny as a whim of fate, plus it's not like the Saiyans or the Namekians will die with Universe 7, they're still alive and thriving in other universes. 
No, this matter was personal. It wasn't just the erasure or the elimination. It was quite literally the death of Universe 7 and nothing more to the Grand Priest. Listen, oh Grand Priest, Vegeta struggles to say. It may not be today and I don't know if I'll even be conscious after this. But I will come back and I will defeat you. Not for the sake of something petty like revenge. I'll come and destroy you to prove who is the strongest. As his vision fades and his mouth was the only thing he could move. I wonder about that, the Grand Priest replies. I have heard the same thing from countless other warriors. Some were even stronger than you two. Listen, Vegeta. It is theoretically impossible to defeat Infinity. Hearing this, Vegeta should have been discouraged, felt hopeless, and just accepted his fate like many before him. For what it's worth, it was the end for them, and yet his vision shows him a silhouette of a Saiyan enveloped in Infinity. Super Saiyan Infinity, huh? Vegeta dies right after blurting out those words, his last breath leaving him. He had no doubt that that silhouette was of him. Goku is also taking his last breath by this point. Unfortunately, he lost consciousness before even getting the chance to relish his final few moments. For the Omni Chaos inside of him used this as a chance to take over completely. But it barely took him a second to subdue this Omni Key. Anything less than a full-fledged Omni King is no match for the Grand Priest. Or is it? There was another individual who had been keeping a close eye on this battle the entire time, and with 70% of Universe 7 destroyed, he chooses now as the best time to interfere. Suddenly, a singular point appears in front of them. Everything, even the Grand Priest's assault on Universe 7 comes to a halt. Whoa, who's that guy? Is that Shaggy? Zeno casually states, but then gets smacked by the future Zeno. No, oh, you idiot, that's just the Dragon God. What do you mean, just the Dragon God? I have a name too, you know, he says. Of all people, Zalama, the Grand Priest glares. So you are finally awake. You better not be here to interfere. Oh, not at all, Zalama casually replies. I'm just here for an interesting proposal is all. Meanwhile, Piccolo and Gohan were stunned. Broly was dumbfounded while Katara, Zenith, and Amarok were pleasantly surprised. The Dragon God Zalama has made an appearance for the first time in 7 million years. His emergence strikes a chord in Piccolo. He's taken aback, simply surprised beyond words right now. Gohan is puzzled as well with Broly still unconscious. But the warriors of the 12th universe can't believe their eyes. It's been forever since they last saw him. Brother, it's a pleasure to see you again, Kara expresses himself. I'm glad you're well, Kara, though it seems you still haven't given up on reviving your universe, Zalama replies. Indeed, but we were too foolish to consider the thought of crowning one of us as the new Omni King, Kara states. I see. I'm glad you realized it before doing something irreversible. This young man here meddled with the ritual and has suffered an unimaginable level of psychological torture. That power isn't anyone's to meddle with, Zalama replies. Hey Zalama, I didn't know you had a brother, the Grand Priest questions. Well, no, we aren't actually blood related. It's a long story, but let's just say I was too moved by the circumstance of Katara's birth to just let him wither away. I decided to take him in. Well, that aside, Universe 7 sure has grown ever since I last saw it. I guess I should also pay Super Shinron a visit before we carry out this proposal, Zalama states. Now, wait, I'm not going to entertain any of your funny ideas. This universe will be destroyed. I'll also have to take a look at the other universes to see if they need purging as well or not. It's just been one thing after another, the Grand Priest says, with this razor sharp look in his eyes. He definitely wasn't in the mood for some unfunny joke. You seriously think I'll come all the way here after 7 million years just to make a joke? I am dead serious, man. This needs to happen, Zalama replies. Well, let's hear it, the Grand Priest says. I'll continue the destruction after I'm done with you, I suppose. Back during the first age of the multiverse, when it wasn't divided into different universes, I had a vision. I foresaw seven universes. It seems now is the best time to realize that vision. Let's work together to create a new age, oh Grand Priest. It's about time each universe is given an equal status. Every universe should have a mortal level of above seven, Zalama firmly states. Of all things, you chose this, the Grand Priest replies agitated. Isn't that just your obsession with the number seven? It's absurd. 
four more universes will have to be erased after I'm done with this one. I won't destroy anything that doesn't warrant destruction, however. It's my duty as the mediator. Calm down, hear me out first. It's not about destructions, Llama states. What I'm talking about is evolution. For now, we have universe 1 and 12 as the two ultimate universes, 5 and 8 as the balanced universes, and then the rest. What are you implying, the Grand Priest asks. Isn't it obvious? Let's merge each pair of universes together except 1 and 12. This way each universe will end up with a mortal level above 7 and there will be 7 in total. I also have a plan of evolving Super Shenron into Omni Shenron. Naturally the 7 Omni Dragon Balls will be spread across the 7 universes. The multiverse will experience a terrific advance of mortal level. What do you say, am I a genius or what? Zalama casually replies. Everyone who was witnessing this conversation was downright exasperated. The Dragon God was actually implying to manipulate the string nature and merge two entire universes together. This was insane. For once, even Whis was shocked beyond words. Same goes for the Grand Priest. He was about to reply ruthlessly, but then pauses and considers it for a moment. Such a sudden yet great change would more than make up for the instability caused by Goku and Vegeta. It's probably the best possible solution considering the current turn of events. The Grand Priest approaches the Llama, looks him right in the eye, and just bursts into laughter. Seeing this, Zalama grins. Gohan and Piccolo couldn't put this into words, but hearing Zalama's proposal in the Grand Priest's laughter, they suddenly felt an odd current run down their spines. A chemical reaction triggered inside their brains telling them that there may still be a tomorrow for them and for Universe 7. All right, Zalama. Using that much energy would probably put me to sleep for millions of years. It's a tough decision to make, but still I suppose a better option than what I was considering. I guess I'll take care of the amalgamation. You go take care of good old Super Shinron. Guess we still be the one looking after Zeno-sama while I'm asleep, the Grand Priest states. Wait, Grand Priest, Zalama states. I feel bad for Zenith, but we can't have two Zenosamas coexisting at the same point in time either. I humbly suggest the Patara fusion or the Omni Key will emerge right away once again, Zalama says. His words were intense. Everyone present could hardly hold their breath in his presence and yet he was still making sure to make them choke with these heavy statements. Hearing this, the Grand Priest simply nods and faces towards the Zeno duo. Zeno-sama, I am sorry to impose, but would you be willing to become one with the future Zeno? It's necessary, the Grand Priest requests, his expression dripping with seriousness. As for Zenith, he was glad to see his younger brother just joking around while enjoying this chaotic battle. He recalls the legend of their early days, before the current age of the multiverse. Zenith and Zeno used to have a lot of fun exploring different planets and playing games. Though, as they grew older, Zenith developed an insane thirst for power in battle. He challenged strong individuals, and before long, he became so strong that he'd have to traverse through the universe just to find a worthy opponent. It was during this voyage that he came across Yamoshi. Little did he know that while he was away, however, Zeno was also growing at an insanely fast pace. His strength came from unparalleled innocence and naiveness. Unfortunately, Zenith was away for a long while and we're talking about thousands of years here. During that time, he made worthy allies such as Amara, Katara, and even Yamoshi, but also made a lot of enemies and destroyed hundreds of thousands of genuinely strong warriors. Though it wasn't just his own fault, it's safe to say he played a large role in lowering the mortal levels of a few universes. Eventually, the power of the Omni King emerged within a certain individual. That's right. That's when Zeno became the Omni King. Throughout the 18 universes, Zenith's brother seemed to have the perfect disposition to inherit this power. The multiverse requires Zeno's childish naiveness to enter the new age. By the time Zenith returned to his home planet, it was already too late. The Grand Priest was there. In fact, he was the one who asked Zeno to test out the Omni Key. Right in front of him, his brother erased six entire universes. Karara's Universe 17 was erased, but he survived because he was originally a being who came from outside the multiverse to begin with. 
Amarok was a warrior of Universe 12 who had made plenty of genuine friendships with those in all of the neighboring universes, but seeing how they were all just wiped out, Amarok was decimated. As for Zenith and Zeno, their universe was 13. It was the first to be wiped out of existence. Zenith consciousness alone survived the purging, not because he managed to figure out something at the final moment, but because he and Zeno had the same blood. That caused the discrepancy which resulted in the total separation of his mind from his body. An empty shell remained behind. He couldn't do anything about it. Millions of years had passed at this point and he still can't do anything. Such is the fate of one revered as the Omni King, the single greatest authority in all of the universes. But unbeknownst to him, Zeno answers the Grand Priest's call quite calmly. Will it be interesting? Zeno asks. Yes, of course, I reckon. The multiverse will be entering the most interesting time period yet, the Grand Prix states. The two Zenos look at each other, do a high five, and prepare themselves for this fusion. Zalama presents them with the ultimate Patara earrings that he himself had on for whatever reason. Zeno takes one, and future Zeno takes the other. And the legendary fusion begins. Wait, it's been five minutes, we sass. Why haven't they come out of the fusion yet? Well, that's because anything involving Omniki takes time to mature, Whis. In this particular case, I don't think Zenosama will come out of that fusion until we're done with the restructuring of the multiverse, the Grand Priest says. Meaning, with this fusion, the multiverse was already changing. Now, I have one more favor to ask you, Zalama says. What is it, the Grand Priest replies. I'm going to revive these two Saiyans, he states. This angers the Grand Priest, however. Not a chance. Their existence alone will cause problems again. Why do you want to revive them? I have a Saiyan back there who seems to be itching for some good rivals. Besides, I was watching everything and began to take a liking to them. Don't worry, I'll be taking them back with me, Zalama states. Hearing this, the Grand Priest simply replies, Listen, Zalama. These two won't be revived. I have always been against the idea of revival. A death is a death. Plus, that Omni Key is still dormant within Goku's body. A revival would flip everything we've just done on its head. Though, for old time's sake, I guess you may take their souls. I see. That's reasonable, Zalama replies back. Then, just as Gohan and Piccolo clench their fists in patience, Goku and Vegeta's soul emerge from nothing. Whoa, I thought I was really done there for a moment, Goku says. He looks around and catches Zalama. This encounter causes him to pause immediately. Hey, have we met somewhere before, he says? Hmm? Oh yeah, you asked me for that wish back in the realm of nothing, remember? The wish to eat as much as you want? I gotta say, I wasn't expecting you to be so straightforward, Zalama says, laughing. Goku is thrilled after hearing this reply, as he does his usual thank you pose and asks, But who are you? You're giving off an aura just as intense as the Grand Priest. Vegeta was, of course, also there, just as puzzled, wondering how things worked out this way. Alright, alright, I guess I could tell you. You too, Namekian, listen closely, this will change your understanding of the multiverse, Zalama states while glancing at Piccolo as well. In actuality, there are some realms that exist outside of the multiverse. Some folktales refer to them as higher dimensions or myths even, but they are indeed very real. First, we have the Angel's Realm and then an anarchy of several different realms. The Grand Prix doesn't like this term, but I choose to call it Universe Zero. Naturally, Piccolo, Gohan, Goku, Vegeta, and of course Broly, who had just only regained his consciousness, are all baffled. Are there other strong people out there, Vegeta asks? Yes, very strong. Some of them are folks who were banished from the multiverse just for being too strong, Zalama says. There's also a saying like you guys with an unusual beginning. I'll tell you, among all the opponents who have chosen to challenge me ever, he ranks among the top 5 at the very least. He's even stronger than that celestial form you guys used. Naturally, Vegeta is all ears when he hears the topic of Saiyans, and Goku and the others were listening just as closely as well. Wait, does that mean there's an entire Saiyan race in Universe Zero, Vegeta asks? Well, it's a long story, Zalama continues, but to put it simply, Back when six universes were erased, there was a Saiyan named Yamoshi whose son was about to be born. 
It was a critical moment. His entire universe was about to be erased and he could intuitively feel the end. At that moment, all his thoughts were focused on how to make sure his son stays alive. That's when, just like you, Vegeta, Yamoshi instinctively used the reverse string entanglement technique and used it on his son. His universe was erased in that very instant, but his son Shishido miraculously popped up on a quiet planet in Universe Zero. It's been millions of years since he appeared, and you bet, he's a mutant when it comes to growing stronger, Zalama replies. I have to fight this guy, Goku says in the heat of the moment. Yeah, me too, says Vegeta. This causes Zalama to just burst into laughter. It's not every day that you see something so ironic. These two had just lost so miserably to the Grand Priest and yet they were already looking for a new opponent. My hunch was right, you two are too interesting to just let wither away into nothingness, Salama says. Well then, I have some business to take care of with Super Shenron, but let me just warp you two outside the multiverse. Let's see how far will your ladder go, Zalama says. Goku faces Gohan one last time, pats his shoulder and says, Gohan, I guess this is our final goodbye. Studying is good, but don't forget to train your body, son. I leave everything to you now, Gohan. Take great care of your mother. Gohan gets goosebumps as Goku's words had the utmost sincerity. I declare this as your son, father. It doesn't matter if we merge with Universe 6. I, Gohan, will become the strongest warrior in this entire universe, Gohan sternly declares. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it, Goku replies. What? What's this talk about merging with Universe 6? I didn't hear any of that. Vegeta expresses confused. Well, apparently Lord Zalama proposed the idea of merging the weaker pair of universes together, Piccolo answers. I'm not sure what that means, but it looks like we Saiyans will have a stronghold again. Saying this, Vegeta looks at Broly and he simply gives Vegeta a thumbs up. There was no need to say anything, their pride was already aware of each other's intentions. Vegeta also takes a glance at Gohan and is further reassured. Looks like the future is bright for us Saiyans as well finally. Then Zalama himself comes face to face with Piccolo. I can see it in your eyes young man. You want to ask me a lot of things. Just know I am not nearly as spectacular as the myths may make me out to be. I am simply a remaining warrior from the ancient dragon race and you, my friend, are one of the races who descended from me. Who knows? Maybe one day you'll create a dragon even greater than my creation, Zalama tells Piccolo. I'm glad I got the chance to see you, Lord Zalama. I am grateful, Piccolo expresses himself. Instead of kneeling or acting nervous, he returns Zalama's respect by respectfully looking him straight in the eyes as well. And just like that, Zalama is about ready to warp Goku and Vegeta's souls outside of the multiverse. Wait, Dragon God, where can I find this Shishido Saiyan you speak of, Vegeta asks. Well, it seems he's in the Angel Realm actually, Zalama replies, but I'd be careful trying to deal with him though, he can be a rowdy one, Zalama says. This statement gave Goku and Vegeta a new goal now, to seek and surpass Shishido, the son of Yamoshi. And to that end, their destination for now was the Angel's Realm. Though before they could be warped outside the multiverse, Vegeta faces the Grand Priest and states his final words. Listen, O oh Grand Priest, I will never forget this day. It doesn't matter if it takes 10,000 years or a million years, I will come back and I will defeat you. That is an oath, a testament to my Saiyan pride, he says. Just like that, the two Saiyan warriors were on their way to Universe Zero, and they were about to be pleasantly surprised by the insane number of insanely strong individuals in this, for lack of better words, lawless cosmos.